Hey, Spring Spanish teacher Paulissima here. I welcome you to this Spanish mini course about traveling. To get the most out of this mini course, I recommend you to set aside 15 minutes every day to memorize all the chunks that you will learn in the videos. This way you have them ready right there in your head to start using them in conversations. I will be your guide for the next 10 days to help you to learn the most important Spanish chunks that you will need when you travel to a Spanish-speaking country. You will learn to speak Spanish in the following situations. Going to the airport, traveling by air or by train, going to a hotel or an Airbnb, ordering food in a restaurant or in a food truck, asking for directions and help, and much, much, much more. So, let's imagine you're on a plane to Buenos Aires, Bogotá, Lima, Oaxaca, Montevideo, you name it. And let's say you want to chat with the person sitting right next to you because the flight's going to be five hours and it might be somewhat boring or even awkward to spend that in complete silence, right? As an icebreaker, you may say, Hola. Hi. Soy Mariana. I'm Mariana. ¿Cómo te llamas? What's your name? You could also say, Hola. Hi. Mi nombre es Mariana. My name is Mariana. ¿Cómo te llamas? What's your name? The other person might respond, Mucho gusto. Nice to meet you. Me llamo Elena. My name is Elena. So, Spanish allows you to introduce yourself in three different ways. Let's go over them once again. Soy Mariana. I'm Mariana. Mi nombre es Mariana. My name is Mariana. Me llamo Mariana. My name is Mariana. In addition to hola, which means hi, you could also say buenos dias, buenas tardes, or buenas noches, depending on the time of day. Sadly, we cannot delve into the details right now, but if you want to know more about these other ways of greeting people, you should definitely watch our video about greetings in Spanish. Okay, once you know the other person's name, you might want to know how old they are. You have two options here. Number one, ¿cuántos años Tienes. How old are you? And number two. ¿Qué edad tienes? They both mean, how old are you? The other person will say something like, Tengo 28 años. I'm 28 years old. Once they've told you their age, they will certainly ask you. ¿Y tú qué edad tienes? Literally, this would translate into what age do you have? Since that translation doesn't make any sense in English, this chunk, ¿Qué edad tienes? is the equivalent of how old are you? You may respond, Tengo 30 años. I'm 30. If you're uncertain about how to say your particular age, you should definitely watch our video about the numbers. Another thing that people usually ask to get to know someone, even if it's just briefly, is what do you do for a living, right? Once again, Spanish gives you two options. Number one, ¿a qué te dedicas? Literally, what do you dedicate yourself to? And number two, ¿en qué trabajas? Literally, what do you work in? Since the word-for-word -word translation doesn't make much sense in English, you should try to learn the chunks in Spanish by heart. Now, let's say this person turns out to be very chatty and they start conversing nonstop about their family, their job, what have you. If you have trouble understanding them, you may say, Disculpa, no hablo mucho español. Sorry, I don't speak Spanish very well. If you want to switch into English, you may ask them, ¿Hablas inglés? Do you speak English? If they do, you may suggest, 
¿Podemos continuar en inglés? Could we speak in English now? Or, let's say you want to challenge yourself in trying to understand most of what the other person is saying, but you need them to slow down. Then, you could say, ¿Pudieras hablar más despacio, por favor? Could you speak more slowly, please? Additionally, if you didn't understand a specific bit and you want the other person to repeat it, you could say, Disculpa, no entendí. Sorry, I didn't get that. ¿Puedes repetirlo? Could you repeat it? You may obviously use all the phrases we've learned so far in any conversation, not just when talking to someone on a plane. Now, let's say the plane has landed, you get off it, but you're not quite sure about where to collect your luggage. Then, you could ask a flight attendant or airport staff, Disculpe, ¿Dónde recojo mi equipaje? Where should I collect my luggage? Once they provided you with the information, you should always say, Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. And if you want to acknowledge how helpful the other person was, then you could say, Muy amable. Very kind of you. So you've got your luggage with you. Now you need a taxi to get to your hotel, but you also need cash to pay for the taxi. What now? Well, you may ask. Disculpe, ¿dónde hay un cajero automático? Sorry, where can I find an ATM? Notice that I've used the word disculpe several times before asking a question. This word may be translated as sorry or excuse me, and we use it to get someone's attention in a polite manner. Now, if you say disculpe, you will be addressing the other person with deference, formally. But if you say disculpa, you will be addressing them informally. If you want to know more about the forms of address in Spanish, you should definitely check out our video about the difference between tú and usted. Okay, you've got cash on you. Now you need a taxi, right? So, the question goes. Disculpe, ¿dónde puedo tomar un taxi? Sorry, where can I get a taxi? You've been told where to find a taxi, you've said gracias to thank the other person for the information, and you're on your way to the taxi rank. Someone gets on your way because they're carelessly looking at the arrivals board. I absolutely hate it when they do that. Anyway, what's the equivalence of excuse me in Spanish in this kind of context? Con permiso. Or simply permiso. Okay, now you're on the taxi. Since taxi drivers usually know their way around cities very well, you might want to ask them. ¿Qué me recomienda visitar? What would you recommend that I visit? In my experience, taxi drivers are very good at telling you where to eat amazing local food. To get this sort of information from them, you may ask something like ¿Qué restaurante me recomienda? Which restaurant would you recommend? Now you're at your hotel, you've checked in, you've left your luggage in your room, and you're starving. Maybe it's time to look for that restaurant that the taxi driver recommended, right? You may ask hotel staff. Disculpe, ¿dónde queda este restaurante? Sorry, where's this restaurant? They will surely give you directions. Some hotels might even offer getting you a cab that can take you there. Let's say the restaurant is right around the corner. You get there and you want to tell the waiter or waitress that you are vegetarian maybe. Then you should say, Soy vegetarian, if you're a woman. Or, Soy vegetariano, if you're a man. Both mean, I'm vegetarian. And to order food, you may say, Quisiera una ensalada sin queso, por favor.
So if there is something you don't want in your food, you should say sin, which means without, plus whatever it is you don't want to eat. If you are allergic to something, you should definitely learn how to say it. If you're a guy, you should say soy alérgico. And if you're a woman, you should say soy alérgica and then add whatever it is you are allergic to. For instance, soy alérgica a las nueces. I'm allergic to nuts. I once traveled with a friend who has a massive allergy to nuts and it was nuts. Now to order a drink, you may say, de tomar, quisiera una limonada. To drink, I'll have a lemonade, please. And we all know that the saddest thing about traveling abroad is spending money. So, how do you ask the waiter or waitress for the bill? La cuenta, por favor. The bill, please. Okay, your holiday is over. You've had an amazing time eating lots of tacos in Mexico City or drinking lots of mate in Buenos Aires and it's time to go back to your country. But you want to take a little something to your mom, your dad, your significant other, or maybe even yourself. So you go into a souvenir shop, you like something, and you want to know how much it costs. What should you say? Once again, you have two options. ¿Cuánto cuesta esto? Or ¿Esto qué precio tiene? Los sustantivos, nouns, are everywhere. Why? Because we use them to name something. Like a place, Mexico, a thing, avión, plane, a concept or an idea, amor, love, or a person, Natalie Portman. So basically, everything. So our first noun is país, country. Here are some ways to use the noun país in a sentence. ¿Qué país quieres visitar? Which country do you want to visit? ¿De qué país eres? Which country are you from? Chunk alert. In Spanish, we say ¿De qué país? which translates into from which country. Learn this chunk by heart and you won't have to worry about the right preposition again. Once you have chosen el país, the country, you need to choose una ciudad, a city. Use it in sentences like these. Mi ciudad favorita es Berlín. My favorite city is Berlin. ¿Cuál es tu ciudad favorita? Which is your favorite city? Let me know in the comments. Once you have chosen una ciudad, a city, you need to determine when you're going to travel. So our next noun is la fecha. The date. La fecha, la ciudad y el país aparecerán en tu bolet. The date, the city and the country will appear on your ticket. Boleto is another important noun, but you should know that not all Spanish-speaking countries use this word. Some, like Spain, say billete, and others, mainly in Central America, use the word tiquete. Chunk alert! In Spanish, we say en tu boleto to mean on your ticket. The date of your trip has finally arrived, así que Situémonos en el aeropuerto. So let's imagine we're at the airport. Check out Paulissima's video about Spanish at the airport for a complete explanation of the chunks that will help you in that situation. In the meantime, you should know that maleta or valija are the equivalent of bag and equipaje is the equivalent of luggage. Use these words in the following sentences. ¿Dónde deposito mi equipaje? Where should I drop my luggage? ¿Dónde recojo mi equipaje? Where should I collect my luggage? 
Now, either at the airport or somewhere in the city you are visiting, you will have to go to the bathroom. So it's important that you know how to refer to it in Spanish, right? This is also one of those words that has a different name depending on the country or the situation. Baño, popular in Mexico. Sanitarios, popular in Colombia, Venezuela, Honduras, El Salvador, Dominican Republic, and Mexico. Servicios, widely used in Colombia, but you also hear it in Mexico. A very important word when traveling abroad is our next noun, comida, food. ¿Dónde puedo probar comida típica? Where can I try traditional food? But if you are starving and just want to have a sandwich or whatever, porque con hambre todo es bueno, because when one is hungry, everything tastes good, Ask, where can you find a restaurant? If you are on a holiday, all you can think about is resting and having fun. Y la cerveza y el vino son buenos amigos. And beer and wine are good friends. These are useful chunks to order them. ¿Qué cervezas tienes? Which beers do you serve? Se me antoja una cerveza. I have a craving for a beer. Quiero una copa de vino. I'd like to have a glass of wine. Now, you might prefer beer or wine depending on our next noun, el clima, the weather. Calor means warmth and frío means cold. These are useful chunks. Hace muchísimo calor. It's really warm. Tengo mucho frío. I'm really cold. In Spanish, we say I have cold instead of I am cold. Why? I have no idea. That's just how it is. So it's better to learn it by heart as a whole, as a chunk, and you will always get it right. The weather might play an important role in you defining what you want to do during your holiday. But unless it's snowing outside, which rarely happens in most Spanish-speaking countries, why would you stay in tu hotel, in your hotel, all day long? Seguro se te antoja un paseo. You might want to take a tour. So make sure you ask for la hora del paseo, the time of the tour, or la hora en que sale el autobús, the time when the coach leaves. It's important that you know keywords that will allow you to ask for help in the event of una emergencia, an emergency, another noun. Make sure you know el teléfono, the phone number to call la policía, the police. If you have been robbed, which I hope never happens to either of us, you could say, Fui víctima de un robo. I have been robbed. Fui testigo de un robo. I witnessed a robbery. Víctima, testigo y robo. Victim, witness and robbery are three more nouns for you. A life-saving chunk is me duele, it hurts, plus the body part that is hurting. Your throat, for example, might give you trouble if you have una alergia, an allergy. To ask for ayuda, help, use the chunk necesito ayuda, I need help. Número uno, en el aeropuerto y a bordo. When we're at the airport, these are the chunks that you will need. Someone will ask you, eh, ¿me permite ver sus documentos? Certificado de vacunación, pasaporte y pase de abordar. You would need to say, claro, aquí tiene. If you're not sure what they're talking about, you could ask this. ¿Qué documentos necesita? In the airplane, they probably will ask, ¿gustaría algo de comer o de beber? For that, you could reply, Sí, me gustaría comprar un sándwich. O, oh, no, 
Por el momento, no quiero nada. Gracias. If you ever get lost and you need direction, you can always ask, ¿Dónde está? And then you add whatever you're looking for. For example, ¿Dónde está el baño? ¿Dónde está el área de equipaje? ¿Dónde está el transporte terrestre? Mi gente, I'm going to give you a little bit of context about how we created this video. So it turns out that a few weeks ago, I went on this trip to Acapulco with one of my English speaking friends. And I realized that if it wasn't for me, she could have been a little bit lost. So I wrote down um, all the things that people were constantly asking. I, you know, uh, I made notes and those are the chunks that I'm teaching you today. If you want to know more about asking for directions, feel free to check out Maria Fernanda's video. She did one just about that and it's very good. And do subscribe to the Spring Spanish YouTube channel so we can continue making more videos like this for you. Número dos, hotel y restaurante. If in your hotel or the restaurant that you decided to go, they don't speak English, don't worry. Just learn this phrase. Tengo una reservación a nombre de. Tengo una reservación a nombre de. And insert your name. También apréndete estas frases que son muy útiles. No tengo reservación. Mesa para dos, por favor. En el área de fumar. Soy alérgico a los mariscos. Soy alérgico a los lácteos. Soy alérgico al gluten. Disculpe, soy alérgico al gluten. Gracias por decirme. Chunk alert. Gracias por decirme. Gracias por decirme. This is a great chunk to learn by heart, you know, like a whole. Four more chunks like this that will be super useful when you are speaking Spanish. Download our essential Spanish chunking kit. The link to download it is right there in the description. Continuemos. Imagínate que estás interesado en comprar el buffet o quieres saber qué beneficios trae tu habitación de hotel. ¿Qué incluye? Todo, pero no incluye bebidas alcohólicas. Pum, pum, pum. ¿Qué incluye? Incluye desayuno. Now, this one is very helpful as well. ¿Acepta tarjeta de crédito? No, solo efectivo. ¿Acepta tarjeta de crédito? Claro, Visa y Mastercard, pero no aceptamos American Express. Now we're in a restaurant. ¿Me puede traer? ¿Me puede traer una piña colada, por favor? ¿Me puede traer una margarita, por favor? ¿En las rocas o frozen? ¿Tiene alguna promoción o descuento? Ofrecemos descuentos para turistas nacionales. Número 3. General Lifesavers. This one you'll need everywhere. ¿Cuánto cuesta? Cuesta 20 pesos. Las siguientes preguntas las puedes preguntar en la recepción de tu hotel o al administrador de tu Airbnb. Necesito ayuda, por favor. Sí, claro. ¿Qué necesitas? ¿Dónde está? Remember this one? We've seen this one before. Eh, ¿Dónde está el hospital? ¿Dónde está la farmacia? You know, you get it. ¿Dónde está el hospital? ¿La farmacia? ¿El baño? ¿El restaurante? ¿La piscina? ¿Mi habitación? No. Some possible answers. Está en la esquina. Está al fondo a la derecha. Está al fondo, a la izquierda, a la derecha, o todo derecho. ¿Cuál es el número de teléfono de la policía, la embajada, emergencias? ¿Cuál es el número de teléfono de emergencias? Claro, el número es 911. ¿Es seguro caminar por aquí? Sí, puede caminar y tomar el autobús sin problema. We're going to start our journey en el taxi. In the taxi. That one's easy. In the taxi towards el aeropuerto. El aeropuerto. The airport. So we are in the taxi and the taxi driver will ask you ¿A qué terminal va? 
a qué terminal va? Which terminal are you going to? Ok, and then you tell him, um, a la terminal 1. A la terminal 1. To terminal 1. Alright, so, tu, tu, tu. Now you are in la terminal, and of course, you need information about your flight. So, first thing you'll do is you will look for las pantallas. Las pantallas. The screens. The screens that have información sobre los vuelos. Información sobre los vuelos. Information about the flight. And then what do you do next? Of course, you go to los mostradores. Los mostradores. The counters. And well, First things first, the lovely person behind el mostrador is going to ask you, ¿A dónde vuela? ¿A dónde vuela? Where are you flying to? And then you will say, A México, por supuesto. A México, por supuesto. To Mexico, of course. So, the lovely person behind el mostrador is going to ask you for your clave de reservación. Clave de reservación. Reservation code. ¿Cuál es su clave de reservación? Mi clave de reservación es 123ABC. Now, if you don't know how to spell in Spanish, we have a video about the alphabet that you can check out here in our Spring Spanish channel, of course. And, well, maybe you don't know the reservation code. And they will ask you for... El nombre del pasajero. El nombre del pasajero. The name of the passenger. And then you give them the name of the passenger, ta -da -da. What else? Uh, very important. ¿Va a documentar equipaje? ¿Va a documentar equipaje? Are you going to check in any luggage? And you'll be like, sí, una maleta, por favor. Sí, una maleta, por favor. Yes, one bag, please. Then, uh, well, if you are crossing a border, they will ask you for your pasaporte. ¿Me permite su pasaporte? ¿Me permite su pasaporte? Can I have your passport, please? Now you have checking your bags, and the next step is to get the marvelous document that the person behind the desk is going to give you after she or him work their magic. Tu, 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 and they give you what? Yeah. They give you el pase de abordar. El pase de abordar. The boarding pass. Now, this document contains very important information. Very important information, right? It contains el número de vuelo, el número de vuelo, the flight number, el número de asiento, el número de asiento, the seat number, la sala de abordar, la sala de abordar, the boarding gate, en el destino, el destino, the destination. So please don't lose your pase de abordar. You have your pase de abordar and then you have your passport and the next step is pasar por seguridad, to pass through security. They will ask you to have your pasaporte and your boarding pass. And now you pass 
seguridad and you are ready to proceed to la sala de abordar, right? To the boarding gate. Of course, you're gonna lose some time there at the Toti Free, trying on all the perfumes, drinking all of these free samples of spirits because that's what we all do and it's very normal and yeah. And then what do we do? Now we are inside el avión. El avión. The plane. And now here I'm not gonna waste so much of your time trying to tell you everything that they will say dentro del avión inside of the plane because this is pretty much international la sobrecargo the flight attendant will literally be mimicking the things that you have to do a very very important phrase that i want you to learn since the aerolíneas aerolíneas the airlines don't give us any like free peanuts anymore you have to learn this one Es gratis. Es gratis. Is it free? Okay, so you are inside el avión. You ask if the snacks are gratis. And now it's time to aterrizar. Aterrizar. To land. Then you land, and if you cross a border, the next step is pasar por migración. Pasar por migración. To go through immigration. After recoger el equipaje, collect your luggage, you will go through la aduana. La aduana. Customs. And yeah, so you pass la aduana, you have nada que declarar, and that's it. Has llegado a tu destino, you have reached your destination. Vamos a ir paso por paso, ¿ok? Primero, first, you're going to be en la recepción in the reception and the lovely person behind the desk is el recepcionista or la recepcionista el recepcionista if it's a man and la recepcionista if it's a woman so the lovely person behind the desk is going to ask you for your passport and your reservation code bienvenidos a paulissima in me permite su pasaporte y su clave de reservación por favor Welcome to Paulissima Inn. May I have your passport and reservation code, please? And you will say, Por supuesto, aquí tiene. Of course, here you are. Pasaporte. Clave de reservación. This is 2020, not 1980. So, most likely you already know qué tipo de habitación ¿Qué tipo de habitación? What kind of room you have? But let's say you're in that one occasion where you don't have a room at all. So the lovely person behind the desk will ask you ¿Qué tipo de habitación necesita? ¿Qué tipo de habitación necesita? And then you can choose. You can have una habitación sencilla, una habitación sencilla, or una habitación doble, una habitación doble. Maybe you are in Cancún and then you get to see the Mexican Caribbean. So you're going to have una habitación con vista al mar, habitación con vista al mar. So la recepcionista is going to work their magic tu, 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 and they will check you in. Now, fun fact. In Mexico, in Mexico, and in other countries in Latin America as well, a lot of people use the word check-in as a noun, and they use it in English. So don't be surprised if you hear things like, vamos a hacer el check-in. Vamos a hacer el check-in. Let's do the check-in or make the check-in. So you're going to receive las llaves. Las llaves the keys. But 
But again, it's 2020, not 1980. So they no longer give keys, they give tarjetas. Y no me gustan las tarjetas. No me gustan las tarjetas. I do not like cards. But anyway. Now, because you're a very smart person, you reserve habitación con desayuno incluido. Habitación con desayuno incluido. So, before you go to your habitación, make sure you ask la recepcionista two very important questions. ¿Cuál es el horario del desayuno? ¿Cuál es el horario del desayuno? ¿Dónde se sirve el desayuno? ¿Dónde se sirve el desayuno? These are very, very important questions. All right, so once you have las llaves o la tarjeta, the keys, you're officially a huésped. Huésped. And then el botón es el botón es will direct you to your habitación. Now you're very generous and you're very cool. So you're going to give the botones a very good propina. Propina. Tip. All right. And before you leave your room, you know, make sure that you also leave propina, a tip, for la camarista. Mis amigos de América del Sur, my friends from South America, They don't say camarista, they say mucama. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. All right, and so they will take you there and you will leave them a propina. Don't forget that in Latin America, a lot of people that work in the tourism industry rely on tips to make ends meet. So please, no seas codo, no seas codo, don't be stingy. And leave una buena propina, a good tip. But What if hotel or hostel is not your preferred mode of accommodation? It's not mine, definitely. I'd much rather stay in an Airbnb. So I'm going to give you a few phrases that are going to be very helpful for your check-in experience. And this will be, ¿Dónde recojo las llaves? ¿Dónde recojo las llaves? ¿Cuál es la clave del Wi-Fi? ¿Cuál es la clave del Wi-Fi? Now, one of the best things about Airbnb is that your anfitrión, anfitrión, your host, is most likely a local. So they can give you good recommendations. And here's a question you can ask them. ¿Me puede recomendar un restaurante? ¿Me puede recomendar un restaurante? And before you leave, you can ask them, if you hadn't already, ¿Dónde dejo las llaves? ¿Dónde dejo las llaves? Well, I hope your stay in a hostel or a hotel or an Airbnb in Latin America was a beautiful and pleasant one and that you're back very, very, very soon. So if you go to a restaurant that is very fancy, or I mean, not really fancy, but the kind that you will have to call before going to make a reservation, you will be met by the hostess, right? And here we have an easy one because in Espanol, we use the same word for hostess. So la hostess will accompany you to la mesa. La mesa the table and she will hand you los menús los menús you guess it the menus in latin america they will be organized in the same way that they are everywhere pretty much so primero primero at first you have las entradas las entradas, the appetizers, and it's very important that you learn this word because it's kind of like a three for one because it not only means appetizers but it also means entry and entrance so entrada is a good word for you. Next thing in the menu will be los platos fuertes, los platos fuertes, 
the main courses. Los platos fuertes literally translates as the strong plates, but we don't mean that, of course. We mean the main courses, or like my American friends call them, the entrees, all right? And al final, at the end, in a regular menu, in a regular menu, you will have los postres. Los postres. The desserts. Like in most places, you will order first las bebidas, las bebidas, the drinks. And el mesero, or la mesera, if it's a woman, el mesero is a man, will come to la mesa and ask you something like, ¿les ofrezco algo de tomar? It doesn't really matter how this particular mesero says it, what you are looking for here is the keywords algo de tomar, algo de tomar, something to drink. So you can order agua, agua, water, cerveza, cerveza, beer, but how would you order? All right, there are many ways to do it, but I wanna teach you the easiest one. And this is also a chunk, a chunk of the Spanish language that will be useful for you, not only in the context of a restaurant, but in other contexts. And pay attention, here it comes, is para mí, para mí, for me. So you could say, para mí, agua, por favor. For me, water, please. Para él, agua, también. For him, water, too. For more food vocabulary, please follow our Spring Spanish YouTube channel. We have a whole series there of videos for traveling and for beginners, and you most certainly will find all of that you're interested in right there. So, el mesero comes back to la mesa, the waiter comes back to the table and he will ask you something like, ¿Están listos para ordenar? ¿Están listos para ordenar? Are you ready to order? Pay attention here for two keywords, listos, ready, and ordenar, to order. Most likely you and your friend are still not listos para ordenar and you need more time. You could say, no, no estamos listos. No, no estamos listos. But you could also say this one, which I really love and you can use for other occasions too. Cinco minutos, por favor. Cinco minutos, por favor. Five minutes, please. So now, el mesero comes back to la mesa after cinco minutos, and he will take your order now. And you will order first las entradas, the appetizers. You know how to do this now. So, para ella, una ensalada César, por favor. Para ella, una ensalada César, por favor. That is for her a Caesar salad, please. But what if you're sharing, okay? This phrase might come handy when you do that. Let's say, vamos a compartir. Vamos a compartir. We are going to share. All right, so you will tell el mesero, Vamos a compartir las empanadas, por favor. Vamos a compartir las empanadas, por favor. We're going to share las empanadas. If you don't know what las empanadas are, you are really missing out in life. You have to know this. There are these delicious pies filled with all kinds of fillings, delicious. They, you can find them all through Latin America. Every country has their own version. And really learn this one because you can never go wrong with 
a delicious empanada. Now you're ready to order your plato fuerte, your main dish. And you will order probably pollo, pollo, chicken, carne, carne, which means meat, but most of the times people use it to just say beef. Or you can order cerdo, cerdo, pork, pescado, pescado, fish, or un platillo vegetariano, un platillo vegetariano, a vegetarian dish. Now you're eating and you're like enjoying your delicious comida. You're going to town to your comida and boom, you drop your fork. No te preocupes, don't worry. You can always ask el mesero for un tenedor, una cuchara. But maybe you drop it all and you are super clumsy like me and you will need a whole set of cubiertos, cubiertos. And you will ask your mesero, unos cubiertos por favor, unos cubiertos por favor. I mean, of course, you're not gonna show the cubiertos because if you had them, you wouldn't need them. Now you're really enjoying your meal. You're going to town to your comida, to your meal. And then you have like a chunk of bread in the back of your head. And then you have like pieces of meat and salsa all over. You will need first a course on good manners. And the other thing that you will need is una servilleta. Una servilleta, por favor. Now, estás lleno. Estás lleno, you are full. But el mesero comes back to your mesa and asks you, ¿desean algo más? ¿Desean algo más? Would you like anything else? And what's the point of living if you cannot order dessert? So you order a postre, postre. And once you're really, really, really done with your meal after el postre y todo and everything, now you are ready to order the check. Of course, you can get away with this, but it is very useful to learn this one. La cuenta, por favor. La cuenta, por favor. Now, don't forget that throughout Latin America, tips are really, really important for everybody that works in the tourism industry. So this is not your time to be stingy. No seas codo. Don't be cheap and leave 15%. I think 15% will be the default. You could leave 10% maybe, but I would only recommend that if you were like alone and, only, and you only had like una cerveza, that's okay. But if you were more than one person in a table and you had like a proper meal, please leave 15%, 15%. Número uno, en el restaurante. Sometimes at a restaurant es necesario quejarse si, por ejemplo, el servicio es talento or if your food is not what you expected. Disculpe, uh, pedí mi comida sin cebolla. ¿Podría cambiarme el plato, por favor? Enseguida, señorita. O... Oh. Es la segunda vez que mi café está frío en este restaurante. Mesero, tráigame otro, por favor. Disculpe, señorita. Ahorita le traigo otro. Chunk alert! If I had a penny for every time I've heard mi café es frío, I would be rich. The way we natives say it, it is, mi café está frío. Learn it by heart as the chunk. And by the way, now you know how to say, mi café está frío. So it will surprise you we also say, mi café está caliente. O el día está frío. See how it works? Easy, right? If you like to learn more chunks like this, you must download our free essential Spanish chunking kit. It contains lists full of the most frequently used Spanish chunks that will help you speak Spanish without thinking about grammar all the time. Link in the description. Número 2. En el aeropuerto. ¿Quién no ama viajar? But unfortunately, sometimes airports might be stressful. Overall, when they've lost their baggage or you find out your flight is delayed. 
El vuelo tiene 6 horas de retraso. ¡Qué pésimo servicio! Exijo una compensación. Sí, de hecho, existe una compensación por cada hora de retraso. Pase por aquí. Señorita, creo que mi maleta está extraviada. Vengo del vuelo AM026. ¡Oh! Lo sentimos, por favor. Llene este formulario. Número 3. En el hotel. ¡Nice! You've made it. And you're finally about to have some rest at your hotel. But you might encounter some issues and you should know the basics. El baño no tiene agua caliente. Una disculpa, en este momento llamo al fontanero. ¿Cómo que no está nuestra reservación? La hicimos hace un mes. No se preocupe, respetaremos su reserva. La habitación que reservamos tiene vista al mar, pero la que nos dieron tiene vista a la calle. ¡Qué pena! En un momento le asigno su habitación con vista al mar. El clima no sirve y hace mucho calor. No se preocupe, mantenimiento ya va para allá. Gracias por su estancia. Chunk alert. El clima no sirve is another excellent example of a good chunk to learn. It's a small but very useful. Learning that will help you to say la tele no funciona, mi teléfono no sirve, and many other sentences. Número 4. En la vida cotidiana. Of course, we don't need to be having leisure time for things to go not so smoothly. Every day we can be in situations where it is necessary to complain. Don't you hate when people try to jump the line in el super? Hey, no se meta en la fila. Allá está la cola. Oh, lo siento, no me di cuenta que había una fila. Or when you go around and around on a parking spot. Este es un enorme problema de la plaza. Nunca hay donde estacionarse. Or what about when you have noisy neighbors? Oiga, yo trabajo mañana muy temprano. Bájale a su música o voy a llamar a la policía. Perdón, no nos dimos cuenta. Ya le bajamos. With the chunks that I'm going to teach you, you will be able to have a great experience comiendo en la calle. Chunks, yeah, chunks. Chunks are pre-made phrases or word combinations that you hear natives using all the time. And when you use them, you instantly sound more natural speaking Spanish. Here at Spring Spanish, our team of polyglots and linguists have put together a method that is based on the use of chunks to ease the way of our students into fluency. More on that in the free Spanish chunking training that you can access in the link in the description. So you get to the place. Usually a taco or torta stand, they will have a menu, so you will have what fillings there they have available, but sometimes quesadilla stands or tamales stands, they don't usually have a menu, so you can always start your experience with this beautiful chunk. ¿De qué hay? Literally, it means like, of what kind do you have? Of what kind there is? Sometimes, even if you see a menu, not all the items will be available, so you can use this chunk. Si hay de todo, literally, it's like, do you have of it all? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Siguiente chunk. Once you know what you want, you can always say, me da? It literally means like, can you give me? So you will place your order with this beauty of a chunk. Me da. Me da dos de pastor y uno de bistec, por favor. Another chunk. Con todo, with everything. This is what Mr. Taquero o Lady Quesadilla is going to tell you, right? Con todo, with everything. Now, what constitutes todo may vary. If you want the full experience, answer with this chunk. Sí, con todo, por favor. ¿Qué lleva? ¿Qué lleva? If you are not sure what the dish comes with, you can use this chunk. ¿Qué lleva? To ask what they will put on it. Typical things that can go on street food are salsa, queso, nopales, cilantro, 
other chunks to specify how you want your street food. Poca salsa, a little bit of salsa. Natural, natural, like natural. It's a very Mexican way to tell that you don't want anything like lettuce or any sort of vegetable on your taco or in your quesadilla. You just want the thing and the filling and no extra veggie that, you know, you don't want it. So you say natural. Me da dos tacos al pastor naturales. Now, this is a very, very important cultural insight. The relationship between you and your street food provider, it's based on an unshakable, unshakable trust. Never, never lie to your taquero, please. And why do I say this? Well, because when you order street food and, well, you can always ask for la cuenta, por favor, you will sound way more natural if you use these chunks. Me cobra, por favor or ¿cuánto es? Now, the person working in the stand will probably reply to you with something along the lines of ¿qué le cobro? ¿qué fue? or ¿cuántos fueron? You see, the person in the stand is often not keeping track of how much you've eaten. So they will ask you how much they should charge and this is why I say that you should never lie to your taquero. Be honest, if you had five tacos, say you had five tacos. So, when el taquero says, ¿qué le cobro? This is when you tell them what your order was. Answer with the number and type of food that you had. So, basically, you will just repeat your order. ¿Me cobra, por favor? ¿Qué le cobro? Dos tacos de pastor naturales y uno de bistec. Next time you come to Mexico City and you're eating street food, do use these chunks and I promise you will be able to communicate with no problem. Now, of course, Mexican food is way more than just tacos. So let's go over some of the most delicious dishes that you will find in Puestos Callejeros. As you may know, Mexican cuisine is part of UNESCO's list of intangible cultural heritage of humanity. And one of the reasons we got such distinction, it's because we still preserve the way uh, the indigenous people were cooking before the Spaniards invaded our land. Back then, our food was based on three key ingredients, corn, chilies, and beans. And guess what? It still is. So yeah, before the Spaniards invaded our land, you know, the indigenous people were already making tacos and sopes. But then when the Spaniards came, they brought the ingredients from the old world and then they mixed them with what we had and we created a whole new cuisine, which is fantastic. I'm telling you this because you will notice how many times I'm going to say the words corn, chili, and beans when I describe the dishes that are most commonly found in Puestos Callejeros. You will notice that many of our antojitos, which literally means little cravings, are basically different arrangements of the same ingredients. Guaraches. Guaraches are made with some sort of like long tortilla, thick long tortilla that kind of resembles a typical Mexican sandal called huarache. They are cooked on a flat grill and are usually topped with a layer of beans, salsa, queso, and crema. Additionally, they can be topped with bistec, a thin cut of beef that we eat a lot in Mexico, or longaniza, some sort of Mexican sausage, and other kind of meat. Sopes. Sopes are open-faced, thick tortillas that are topped with things like papa con chorizo, potatoes with chorizo. They are topped with cheese, salsa, and onion. This dish is also known as picaditas or pellizcadas, which means like little pinch ones. And in other parts of Mexico, where they are not usually topped with meat. Gorditas, little fat one. It's a very thick corn tortilla where the dough that is used to make the tortilla has been mixed with chicharrón and then grilled. Once it's cooked, it's then sliced into some sort of a pocket and then filled with cheese, onion, salsa, and your filling of choice. The filling type depends on where in the country you are. Typical ones is the la gordita de chicharrón prensado. You know, the, the dough, the masa has chicharrón in it, but then they put even more inside. Quesadillas. 
This one can be some sort of a controversial topic in Mexico. When you hear the word quesadilla, for the vast majority of Mexicans, you know, quesadilla, it's like queso. So when we think about a quesadilla, the vast majority of Mexicans, we think of a tortilla that has cheese in it and then something else like um, mushrooms or flor de calabaza, um, squash blossoms. But we think that it should come with cheese first, but not in Mexico City. In Mexico City, when you say quesadilla, they just refer to this like elongated tortilla that has some sort of a filling and then it's folded and heated on a comal. No cheese. You have to specify that you want cheese on it. Like it's a quesadilla. It should have queso. I'm not gonna fight with 25 million people living in Mexico City, right? So guaraches, quesadillas, sopes and gorditas are usually served in the same stand. And lately I've been noticing that these stands are usually run by women on like tacos who are which are like most of the time run by men i don't know something that i've been noticing recently now remember i mentioned something about the tea diet well we call it la dieta t and la dieta t we just call this like a series of great dishes that all start with letter t con la letra t like tortas tacos tamales tamales. Now, if you've been in Mexico City, you probably heard the sound. Corn dough mixed with a little pork lard spread to the inside of a corn or banana husk. Then salsa, which could be green, red, etc. and some meat. It can be pork or chicken or some vegetables like jalapeño or chile poblano. Tamales are cooked in steam. Yeah, they're steam. And they're usually a morning food in Mexico City. In Mexico City, as if tamales weren't already a bump of carbs, they have this like tamal sandwich. So they put the tamal inside a bun that is called bolillo. And it sounds weird, but it's actually very good. Next one is torta. Tortas are Mexican. Mexico's sandwiches. On top of the main ingredient, usually some cold cuts or cold meats, they put lettuce, onion, tomato, avocado, and your choice of chile, chipotle, or jalapeño in it. They're delicious. And the bread that we use for teleras, I mean for tortas, is called Teleras. It's a specific kind of bun, yeah, of bread that we use for making these beautiful, amazing sandwiches. By the way, the word torta in other Spanish speaking countries doesn't mean this, it means cake. But in Mexico, a torta is like our version of a sandwich. Um, and the telera is spread with refried beans and mayonnaise. It's delicious. My favorite type of torta is torta de milanesa, Milanese torta. Like, I love them so much. Like, if you want to ever kidnap it, you can like use a torta de milanesa as bait and I will fall for it. Next dish in la dieta te, tacos. All right, so tacos are normally made with two smallish tortillas and then they are topped with chopped meat, usually beef or pork, and then they are garnished with cilantro y cebolla. And some people say that the key to an amazing taco is la salsa, and I agree. So Let's start con el desayuno with breakfast. A typical thing that you can have, it's quite universal. Huevos, eggs, and you can have your eggs fried, fritos, or estrellados. I love that word because estrellados means both smashed and star-studded. Isn't that poetic? You can have your scrambled eggs with something else, for example, Huevos con jamón, eggs with ham. Huevos con tocino, eggs with bacon. Or huevos con salchicha, eggs with sausage. Or actually, hot dog. For breakfast, you could also have cereal, cereal. Or you can have hot cakes, which are pancakes. These are actually mini hot cakes. Yeah, in Mexico, we call pancakes hot cakes. Another thing that you can have for breakfast is, of course, fruta, fruit. Here I have plátano, banana. It's also called banana in some Latin American countries. I have a durazno, a peach, and I have a few nectarinas, nectarines. What about drinks for el desayuno? 
Well, you can have un vaso de jugo de naranja, a glass of orange juice, or you can have un vaso de leche, a glass of milk. Obviously, like everybody else in the world, I can start my day without una taza de café. What else can you have for breakfast? Well, this is super universal. Pan, bread, and you can spread some mantequilla, butter, and also you can spread some mermelada on it, marmalade. If you put the pan in the toaster, that is pan tostado or tostada. Yeah, in some countries in Latin America, they call it just tostada, a toast. Now, let's jump to el almuerzo or la comida. Now, we typically start el almuerzo or la comida with a sopa, soup, it's also called caldo. A caldo is specifically a clear broth based soup. So you can have, for example, a sopa de pollo, chicken soup, or a, let's say, caldo de pescado, a fish soup, or a caldo de res, a beef soup. And I kind of like them all, except el caldo de res, because I'm sorry, mom, I really, I just, I can't. Because you gotta eat it super, super fast, otherwise la grasa, the fat gets like solidified on top and it's like really, I don't know, I just, I just. So you will have typically a meat-based uh, lunch. You can have, like I said, you can have pollo, chicken, res, beef, cerdo o puerco, pork, and you will have a side. If you are in my beloved Mexico, for example, a typical side would be frijoles negros, black beans. Also, another very typical one would be this. Can you see it? Oh, yes, you can. That is some arroz blanco, white rice. Your lunch will come with verduras or vegetales. They both mean vegetables, but I think in Mexico, yeah, and in some other countries too, we use the word verduras more. Some of the verduras that you can have in your meal will be papas, potatoes, or this one, camote, sweet potato. Now, when you order your lunch, you will have some verduras in it, most likely, and even if you don't see them, they will be there, you know, because we use um, verduras to season a lot. So, for example, typical things that you can have in a Latin American comida would be tomate, tomato, cebolla, onion, chile, this is an habanero one, by the way, and you can have also ajo, garlic. Now, fun fact, we call a, each piece of a garlic un diente de ajo, which literally means a tooth of garlic. I, I just love that. I just love it. It's so cute. A tudo garlic, un diente de ajo. Now we can also have una cebolla morada, which literally means purple onion, but we mean red onion. More about how to use the proper color for each noun, because it, sometimes it changes. Uh, you can find more about that in a video, of course, in here in the Spring Spanish YouTube channel. It's a great video, by the way, by one of the other teachers. Now, what about some bebidas, some drinks that you can have with your lunch? Well, you can have my favorite of all times, cerveza, beer, or you can have a chiqui copa de vino. Okay, here pay attention with the word copa de. Remember when I told you about the drinks that we have at breakfast, I said vaso de jugo, glass of juice, but for the wine, we don't use the word vaso. We have a specific word for that, and that is copa. This is una copa de vino tinto, a glass of red wine. Also, attention here with the word tinto, because it turns out that in Colombia, they use the word tinto to refer to a black coffee. Like I said before, Latin America is like a super diverse region. We, we have some of the best cuisine in the whole world. I tell you, I'm not lying. But we also have some dishes that you can find throughout the region. Obviously, in each country, they will have 
their own way to do it and their own ingredients. But I'm pretty sure that when you are out in a restaurant, uh, you probably will find some common dishes and I'm gonna show you four of them. So the first one will be empanadas. Each country has their own way to do them and they're like these beautiful, heavenly made pastries, but they're savory and they're like filled with meat or vegetales and they can be either baked or fried, corn-based or wheat-based, delicious. Second one, picadillo. And this is like a meat-based, most likely beef-based dish mixed with tomatoes and other vegetales, otras verduras, remember, vegetables. And it's made with either shredded or ground beef. Third dish that I want to share with you, it will be ceviche. Ceviche is a delicious seafood dish. I'm pretty sure that you're familiar with it. It is made with either fish or seafood that has been cooked in lime juice. It's just absolutely delicious and I promise you will love it regardless of where you're having it. And the fourth dish that I want to share with you, it's really not more of a dish, but of our experience, un asado, or in Mexico we call it carne asada. It's like a, a cookout grill experience where you have carne, fuego, cerveza, amigos, meat, fire, beer, friends. Life doesn't get any better than going to a Latin American asado or to a carne asada. Trust me on this one. And now maybe you're, you know, you're traveling, you've been having all kind of typical dishes throughout the day, and for dinner you want something that you're familiar with. Maybe you just want a pasta, and you're in luck because we say pasta the same in Spanish. So pasta is pasta, <laughs> pizza is pizza, hamburguesa, that means burger. So there you are, you can order all of these three things. Hamburguesa, pasta, or pizza, and you will be fine. Now you're a bit stuffed, you don't want your pizza to be with all of this carne, with all of this uh, meat, so you want una pizza vegetariana, a vegetarian pizza. What can you put in your vegetarian pizza? Well, these are typical things that you could put in a vegetarian pizza, right? So we have esparragos, asparagus, and we have un pimiento morrón, a bell pepper, or a pepper, you say? And we also have some champiñones, mushrooms. Other things that you could put in your pizza vegetariana could be, for example, espinacas, spinach, or calabacita. Literally means little pumpkin. I love that word, calabacita. It's a zucchini. Now, remember how at the beginning of the video I told you that we have a specific word to mean to have breakfast? Well, that word is desayunar. And we also have specific words for each meal of the day. So to say that you will have lunch, we say comer means to eat, literally, but it also means to have lunch. And we have another word that is almorzar. And to have dinner, we say cenar. Now, let's use those uh, verbs in some questions. ¿Qué desayunaste? What did you have for breakfast? Desayuné cereal. I had cereal for breakfast. ¿Qué almorzaste? Almorcé una ensalada de pollo. I had a salad with chicken for lunch. ¿Qué cenaron? What did you have for dinner? Cenamos una pizza hawaiana. We had a Hawaiian pizza for dinner because we have no shame and we put piña in la pizza. We put pineapple in the pizza. I know it's controversial. Reservaciones. 
So you might have seen in the textbooks that we say things like, por favor quisiera hacer una reserva o una reservación para cinco personas. But do you know what to say when you actually get to the restaurant? Here are a couple of options you can use to let them know you have made a reservation. Tengo una reserva o una reservación a nombre de... Then you say the name. Mesa para cinco a nombre de... You could start like this, just saying table for five and then add the name. Or... Maura, mesa para cinco. You could start with the name and just leave it there or add the number of people as well. Yo personalmente tiendo a hacer esto y solo decir el nombre. Porque normalmente los anfitriones están ocupados, el lugar es ruidoso, no hay que acercarse demasiado por el COVID y en definitiva solo necesitan saber el nombre. Número 2. Estamos esperando o pensando. Next stage. You are already at the table. The waiter comes to ask if you'd like to start ordering something, but you're not ready. Si esto se debe a que todavía estás esperando a alguien, puedes decir. Estamos esperando para variar. Si todavía estás revisando el menú, Estamos pensando, gracias. And that's it. You can add a gracias if you want to be polite, which you should, but that's all. It's a very typical scenario, both for waiters and customers, so no further explanation needed. <sighs> Chunk alert. Para variar is one of those chunks I never hear Spanish learners use and that you should certainly have in your pocket. It requires real insider knowledge. It translates to to vary, pero lo que realmente significa es exactamente lo contrario. O sea, implica el uso de sarcasmo necesariamente. Si dices, estamos esperando para variar, se entenderá inmediatamente que no es una variación en lo absoluto tener que esperar por esa persona, sino más bien un hábito. Of course that means you're sarcastically complaining a bit, so that you don't have to complain about missing out on this insider knowledge. Why don't you check the link in the description and download our free essential Spanish chunking kit con los chunks más utilizados por los nativos del español. Número 3. ¿Tú qué prefieres? Being friendly with the waiter or waitress is very common. So, instead of using a more formal ¿Usted qué me recomienda? You can try saying ¿Tú qué prefieres? Another one could be ¿A ti qué te gusta más? Watch until the end if you want to know the chunks that talk about the food you eat at the restaurant. Número 4. ¿Eso con qué viene? I'm not even sure what textbooks will tell you to say. But just saying this, referring to a dish you're discussing with the waiter or just pointing at it on the menu will suffice. ¿Eso con qué viene? Ensalada o papas. It's usually salad or potatoes, because let's face it, that's a commonality in America. America means the continent, by the way. Also, if you want to ask for something extra, not on the menu, like a portion of French fries on the side, this is what you'd say. Genial, la ensalada y una ración de papas fritas aparte, porfa. You can change papas fritas for anything else. Just make sure to say una ración aparte. Número 5. Aperitivos. If there's anything that can help you break free from the shackles of textbook Spanish is accepting the fact that Spanish is a super rich, yummy language that has multiple flavors. This tends to mean we have many different words for the same thing. 
aperitivos es una de ellas. Puedes usarla y se entenderá perfectamente, pero casi nadie los llama así. Aquí están algunas de las alternativas y sus países según mi investigación. Pasa palo, Venezuela. Pasa bocas, Colombia. Picoteo, Chile. Boquitas, El Salvador. And for Mexico, we're going to ask Paulísima. Hola, Maura. Well, in Mexico, we call them botanas or aperitivos. Or you can also say algo para compartir o algo para picar. Gracias, nena. We are many more. So just keep an ear out for how the natives say it wherever you are. Número 6. La carne. This works exactly the same. We do not have just one way to refer to how meat is cooked. And that's the most important thing I'm teaching you in this section. Certain commonalities can be found though. For instance, blue rare, rare, medium rare. A esto suele corresponderle colores en español, como azul, rojo o rosado. Medium, medium well, well done. En español también solemos usar término medio para el medio. Luego varía entre las palabras tres cuartos, hecho, bien hecho o bien cocido. Bottom line, either ask around before or talk to the waiter. Es más que común no saber con exactitud debido a la cantidad de variaciones que tenemos en nuestro idioma. Así que ni te preocupes. Número 7. Preferencias. There are a few things that are quite common to have preferences or requirements about, like allergies or being vegan or vegetarian. Also, when to bring certain things. In this section, we'll go over them. Alergias. Digamos que tengo alergia a las nueces. Podría decir, Esto tiene nueces porque soy alérgica. Or, soy alérgica a las nueces, así que no puedo llevar nada en lo absoluto. Tener y llevar are the verbs you use in Spanish to refer to what the food contains. Also, don't hesitate to be emphatic about it. Comida vegana o vegetariana. This isn't as part of the mainstream as it would be in North America. So don't trust the word itself. Fully explain what this means. Like this. Soy vegana, así que no como nada que provenga de animales. Ni huevo, ni leche, ni mantequilla. ¿Cuándo traer algo? It is quite common to ask to bring the drinks with the food, meaning the main dish. And for that, you can say, Quisiéramos una botella de vino tinto, pero porfa tráelo con la comida. Número 8. Sobre la comida. Everything's about the food, right? Let's go over some of the most common situations you could run into. Me traes un poco de... This is what you could use anytime you need a little bit more of anything. Make sure to use a question tone, like this. Me traes un poco de sal, porfa. Y hielo. Y servilletas. Y limón. Está buenísimo. Sometimes the food is amazing and we love being emphatic about things like that. So you can use está buenísimo as well as... Está increíble. Mm, está delicioso. Mm, está de muerte. Está excelente. Mm -mm. ¿Quieres probar? If the food is really good, we will definitely share amongst everyone on the table. Es muy normal pasarse los platos o meter el tenedor en el plato de la otra persona. Let me know in the comments if this is common for you as well. If it's super good, you could even say, mm. Tienes que probar esto. As you can see, I'm not asking. I'm straight telling them. Estoy full. 
Again, if the food was incredible, chances are you are super full. Here are three more choices to refer to this. No puedo más. Estoy que reviento. Me muero. Me lo pones para llevar. This is what you would say if you are que revientas, but there's still food on the table. Just again, make sure to say this with a question tone. Me lo pones para llevar, por fin. Número nueve. Pagar. Okay, let's look at two different scenarios here that probably aren't covered in the textbooks. Splitting the bill. You would just need to say, vamos a dividir la cuenta to let them know. Use cóbrame to say how much to charge your card with. And cuánto falta o queda to ask how much else needs to be paid. Vamos a dividir la cuenta. ¿Cuánto queda? 20 euros. Vale. Porfa, cóbrame los 20. Leaving the tip. Sometimes it gets tricky because you don't have cash and you don't know how it works. So I always make it a thing to directly ask ¿Te puedo dejar la propina con la tarjeta? Similarmente, puedes decir ¿Te puedo dejar la propina por acá? Summary. Let's review real quick in case your brain is messing with you and you got a bit hungry. Things you could say at the door. Tengo una reservación a nombre de... Solo el nombre. The first things you could say at the table. Estamos pensando o esperando. ¿Tú qué prefieres? ¿Eso con qué viene? Tenemos una sola forma de decir aperitivos o para hablar de la carne. No, así que mejor preguntar. Preferences. Soy alérgica a... Soy vegetariana, así que no como animales. Porfa, trae el vino con la comida. About the food. ¿Me traes un poco de sal? Está buenísimo. ¿Quieres probar? Estoy full. ¿Me lo pones para llevar? Paying. Vamos a dividir la cuenta. Cóbrame. ¿Cuánto queda? ¿Te puedo dejar la propina por acá? Did you notice I said I was going to teach you with chunks and not words? Well, a chunk is a word combination that native Spanish speakers use all the time when talking to each other, and you should be using them as well. This word combination will always be correct. After all, you just have heard a native speaker using it, and you don't have to think about which preposition nor verb conjugation to use. And besides, when you are all lost in the city, the last thing you want to think about are grammar rules. Chunking is how we teach Spanish in all our videos and our academy. If you'd like to learn more about it, feel free to check out the Spanish chunking training we have on our website, where we demonstrate it in detail and give you tons of examples. So, ¿dónde estaba? Where was I? Ah, yes! I was talking about the chunks and phrases we use when asking for directions. First, I will teach you how to approach a person to ask for directions. This is very simple. Disculpe, señor, or disculpe, señorita. Excuse me, sir, or excuse me, miss. ¿Puede ayudarme? Can you help me? Then, use any of the following magic questions and add whichever place you are looking for. ¿Dónde está el centro de la ciudad? Where is the city center? ¿Dónde hay una farmacia? Where is a pharmacy? ¿Cómo llego al hotel? How do I get to the hotel? Did you notice that donde está y donde hay, they 
mean the same in English, where is, well, the difference is that donde esta means you're being specific about a place and therefore you use the definite article el or la, either if it's masculine or feminine. In this example, you're talking about el centro de la ciudad, the city center. Meanwhile, donde hay, you don't need to be specific. You're actually talking about any place. And in our example, we're saying donde hay una farmacia, where is a pharmacy, and it could be any pharmacy from the neighborhood. In that case, we use the indefinite article un or una. But if you need a reminder, feel free to check out my articles lesson. Eventually, someone will help you with the directions, and the first thing I suggest you to learn is, ¿Puede hablar más despacio, por favor? Could you talk slowly, please? ¿Puede repetir, por favor? Could you repeat, please? These chunks will help you in case they have spoken so fast that you didn't get any of the directions. And by the way, remember you're talking to an unknown person and that is what you're going to address in a third person of usted puede and not tú puedes. Remember, speaking with usted, it's a symbol of politeness. Before I give you some chunks that you will hear when getting answers to your direction questions, did you know that we publish five free Spanish lessons every week just like this one on YouTube? Make sure to subscribe and hit the bell button to not miss any of them. Okay, now you will have to expect that the person that you just asked directions, they might answer just like this. Ah, está muy fácil llegar ahí. Ah, it is very easy to get there. Or, uff, está un poco lejos y complicado. It is a bit far and complicated. In any case, you need to know what they are saying in Spanish. I know you have Google Maps, but come on. You didn't get this far to use Google Maps and take this opportunity to speak with the locals and use your Spanish skills. First, let's talk about all the basic vocabulary and the chunks that you will most probably hear when asking for directions. Vas todo derecho, go straight, giras a la derecha, turn right, das vuelta en la calle de Pinzón, turn on Pinzón Street, sales a la izquierda en la glorieta, exit to the left on the roundabout. Caminas hasta topar con pared. Walk until you reach the wall. Pasas por la avenida Insurgentes. Pass by Insurgentes Avenue. Buenas tardes, señor. ¿Podría ayudarme? Ay, gracias. ¿Cómo llego al centro de la ciudad desde el hotel? Ah, muy fácil. Sale del hotel y camine todo derecho. Uh -huh. Cuatro cuadras, después gire a la derecha. En la esquina verá una iglesia y ahí es el inicio del centro. Ok, muchas gracias. Espero no perderme. Muy bien, mis amigos. Now, second scenario. You're driving and you want to get to the highway. So, you stop at the street and ask for a local to help you with the directions. Disculpe, ¿puede ayudarme? Sí, dígame. ¿Dónde está la salida hacia la autopista? Ah, pues está un poco complicado, pero tiene que manejar todo derecho hasta la calle de Pinzón, da vuelta a la Ajá. izquierda y pase por cuatro semáforos. Número uno, caminar. In Mexico City, the nicest, most sought-after neighborhoods are highly walkable. Caminar es una de mis actividades favoritas. Es la forma en la que me transporto más frecuentemente. Seriously, I'm always walking, always. Atención, nuestras aceras y carreteras no son las mejores conservadas del mundo. Así que, atención, caminen con cuidado. ¿Ya vieron? Aguas. ¿Escucharon? Aguas. Literally, waters, but it just means attention or caution. ¿Por qué decimos aguas? It's actually interesting. Well, way back then, where there was not a sewage system, people just, you know, like, do what they had to do in these pots. 
and they would just throw it out the window and because you know it was like liquid they will say they will scream first aguas and then throw it número dos metro ya hice todo un video sobre el metro chequenlo when you buy your tickets you can just say the number of tickets that you want un boleto por favor dos boletos por favor or uno or dos Aquí puedes recargar tu tarjeta de movilidad integrada, que es esta. Algo importante del metro de la Ciudad de México. Expect people selling all kinds of merchandise. Chewing gum, candy, chocolate bars, flowers, plants, clothing, like secondhand clothing or like new clothing, underwear, everything. When it's really crowded, you might hear an officer screaming. Recórrase, recórranse, or avancenle, 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 avancenle. You know, they mean you should like scoot over. Make room. Otras dos cosas muy importantes. Do respect the designated areas for women and children. And don't be surprised if you see locals eating inside the metro. It's actually not allowed, so please don't do it, but you will see that people do do it. Número 3, Metrobús. It's a bus rapid transit system that has been operating in Mexico since 2015. No te puedes perder subirte a los autobuses de doble piso de la línea 7 que recorren el maravilloso e icónico Paseo de Reforma. A ticket is 7 pesos. Vas a necesitar la tarjeta de movilidad integrada. Don't be surprised if somebody asks you to let them in using your card. Yeah, because sometimes people won't have it and they'll offer you cash. And you can ask other people to let you pass too if for some reason you don't have your car but you do have, you do have money. Disculpe, me dejan pasar, le pago. Always smiling, always smiling. There are clear indications in the Metrobus station, so I don't think you're going to get lost. But, you know, just in case you want to make sure you're going in the right direction, you can ask this. Disculpe, aquí estoy bien para... And then you insert the place or, the, you know, the direction that you're going. Disculpe, aquí estoy bien para Indios Verdes. Disculpe, aquí estoy bien para Tepalcates. And also you might hear officers screaming, detrás de la línea amarilla, detrás de la línea amarilla. Behind the yellow line. Aquí en Spring Spanish tenemos más videos sobre medios de transporte. Chequen uno de ellos por acá. Número 4. Autobús. En México, casi toda la gente le dice camión al autobús. There are some smaller buses that people call microbus or simply micro. La verdad es que yo no uso el camión ni el micro. Because for me, it's like if I'm gonna be 30, 40 minutes in a bus, I much rather walk. Vas a necesitar cambio. Y normalmente el mismo conductor cobra o hay otra persona al lado del conductor que cobra. Dato curioso. En México es muy común que la gente use el tiempo que pasa en el camión o en el metro o en otro tipo de transporte público para maquillarse. Don't act surprised when you see this. What do you say to exit el camión? Check out this lovely Mexican Spanish chunk. Bajan, simple. Bajan, which means something like they come down. But don't worry about direct translations. You don't need them. Actually, it will only slow you down. At Spring Spanish, we never use direct translations. They're terrible. Instead, we use a super efficient method for language acquisition called conversation-based chunking. To get you started, you can right now download your free copy of our Spanish chunking kit. The link is in the description. Número 5. Combi. 
Si eres turista, lo más seguro es que no vayas a ir a partes de la ciudad que no están bien conectadas. En las zonas más alejadas del centro de la ciudad, una forma muy común de transporte es la combi. Si tienen la posibilidad de evitar las combis, evítenlas. Yeah, avoid them. And I think that most combi users will give you the same advice. I'm sure that the combi users would go for an other option if they had the option not to take the combi. Aunque no pasa todos los días, cada cinco minutos, sí pasa, desafortunadamente, que asaltan dentro de la combi. Número 6. Cablebus. This is completely new and it's part of the efforts of the government of Mexico City to bring efficient and dignified modes of transportation to people who have been historically, historically left out. And it's so cool. Y está padrísimo. Número uno, numbers and history. El metro. En México solamente hay metro en la Ciudad de México, en Monterrey y en Guadalajara. Since I live in Mexico City, that's the metro that I'm going to show you. I love it. De hecho, después de caminar, el metro es mi medio de transporte favorito. Most of the places of interest in Mexico City can actually be reached by metro, so it's very likely that you actually end up riding it. El viaje inaugural del metro fue el 4 de septiembre de 1969. El metro cuenta con 12 líneas. Cada línea está identificada con un nombre, número y letra. El metro es usado en promedio por 4.6 millones de personas diariamente. El metro cuenta con 195 estaciones. Cada línea ofrece solo un servicio. Which I thought was the standard everywhere in the world, but I learned the hard way that it isn't. Cada estación, además de tener un nombre, está identificada con un icono. These icons were designed by American graphic designer Lance Women, who also designed the logo for the 1968 Olympics that took place in Mexico. No sé tú, pero a mí se me hacen muy lindos. El 12 de julio de 1982, el metro de la Ciudad de México se convirtió en el primer metro del mundo en tener conductoras mujeres. Número 2. Buy a ticket and find your way. El boleto cuesta 5 pesos. También puedes comprar esta tarjeta que se llama tarjeta de movilidad integrada. Cuesta 15 pesos y la puedes recargar en estas máquinas. Ojo, no se aceptan tarjetas. No saben cuántas veces me he quejado de esto. Con esta tarjeta también puedes acceder a otros medios de transporte, como el metrobús o el cablebús, que es nuevo. Actually, I'm working on another video about other means of transportation. Let me know if you want me to go take a ride to the new cablebus. It should be fun. It looks like fun. Atención, por favor. When recharging your tarjeta de movilidad integrada, look at the machine and pay attention to these chunks. Esta máquina no da cambio. O no retire su tarjeta. Also super important, in line 12, they only take la tarjeta de movilidad integrada. They don't take tickets. Like, who makes this rule? Like, seriously, who made the, who make these rules? Mexicans in general are very nice and warm and generous people. So don't be surprised if they ever ask you um, If you, if you can help them if for some reason they run out of cash or they don't have tickets or they don't have the card and you shouldn't feel ashamed to ask for help either. Disculpe, ¿me podría dejar pasar con su tarjeta? Es que solo tengo cash. Claro que sí, pase. 
You might also find people who will ask you, ¿Me regalas una moneda para completar para mi boleto, por favor? You can always answer this in other petitions, other favors with this beautiful phrase. Ahorita no puedo, perdón. You can also ask the guards for help. Oficial, no tengo nada de cambio. Solo tengo tarjeta y la máquina solo acepta efectivo. Porfa, porfa, oficial, déjeme pasar. No sea malito. No más esta vez, oficial. Porfis, porfis, déjeme pasar. Or if you were in line 12, for example, you could say the other way around. Oficial, no tengo tarjeta, solo boleto. Por favor, déjeme pasar, oficial. Solamente esta vez. Ándele, no sea malito, déjeme pasar. In Mexico, calling an uniform person oficial is gonna get you extra points. But less and less people use this word in Mexico. I don't know why. For maleducados. Yes, maleducados. It translates as like ill-educated or poorly educated, yeah. And the worst kind of maleducados are the reason you want to avoid taking the subway during the peak hours, you know, during rush hour hours, because, you know, they might want to steal your wallet or pinch your goodies. Locals will use their elbows to make way through the crowds, and so should you. Si eres mujer o un niño no mayor de 12 años, You can ride the subway in the cars designated specially for you. If you're a woman or a child, I strongly recommend you ride in those cars, especially if you're riding during rush hour. Las horas pico son de las 6 a las 9 de la mañana y de las 6 a las 8 de la noche. Número 3. Take the metro to Bellas Artes. Supongamos que quieres ir al Palacio de Bellas Artes. ¡Vamos! Supongamos que no hay ningún mapa a la vista. We can ask the guards. Disculpe, oficial. ¿Un mapa? They might point you to one or they might tell you something like... ¡Híjole, señorita! No hay mapas. Or... Los mapas están adentro. All right. So there's no map. So you might ask. Disculpe, oficial. Para Bellas Artes, tiene que ir a Chabacano y de ahí trasbordar a la línea azul con dirección Cuatro Caminos. You got that? Estamos en Lázaro Cárdenas. Nos podemos ir a Chilpancingo, que tiene correspondencia con la línea azul y la verde y la café, que es la nueve. Y de Chabacano nos vamos en dirección Cuatro Caminos hasta Bellas Artes. ta -dán. Here's a word you might hear Mexicans using a lot when they talk about riding el metro. El transbordo. That is the connecting passages between lines. El transbordo más largo está en la estación Atlalilco. It's 880 meters long, that's like over half a mile, and it connects lines 8 and 12. In one of these transbordos, the one located in station La Raza, there's a permanent size exhibition that is just lovely. Just check it out. Now, we've arrived to Bellas Artes. To expedite out our way out of the station, we can ask the guards. Disculpe, oficial, ¿de qué lado salgo para Bellas Artes? Or... Disculpe, oficial, ¿de qué lado salgo para el Museo Franz Mayer? Número 4. Fun facts. Dentro del metro hay un museo dedicado al metro. En la estación Mixquack de la línea 12 se encuentra el Museo del Metro. In its collection, you can find some of the archaeological pieces that were found when they were building el metro. Si viste la película Total Recall, you have seen a couple of metro stations already. Una de ellas es el metro Chabacano. Exactamente, the one that we just visited. And if you look closely in the video of Holding On by Disclosure, you can see Station Oceania. 
en las líneas 1, 3 y 7 hay Wi-Fi gratuito. The first convoys of the metro were made in France, just as the first series of tickets. De hecho, la mayor parte del presupuesto para construir el metro vino de un crédito francés. La conexión francesa no termina ahí. Dime, ¿esta imagen te parece familiar? It's just like the Art Nouveau designs in some of the metro stations in Paris. It was a gift, actually, from the French. Dentro de la estación Pino Suárez hay una pirámide. Se llama Pirámide de Ejequeto. And it's actually part of a larger complex that was to uh, worship the Aztec god of the wind. It is the most seen Mexican archaeological site with over 54 million people passing by it every year. Además, en la estación Talismán se encontraron restos de un mamut. Dentro del metro hay 38 murales. Hay estaciones temáticas. Una de mis favoritas es la estación Auditorio que está decorada con todo lo relacionado con la cultura de la Gran Bretaña e Irlanda. Si quieres aprender sobre Mexican Boxing Idols, go to Station Garibaldi Lagunilla. Si quieres aprender sobre lucha libre, make sure you visit Guerrero Station. Si quieres aprender sobre Mexican cartoons, you have to check out Station Zapata. Ya que estás visitando la Ciudad de México, tienes que ir al Zócalo. El Zócalo es la plaza pública más importante de mi país y está localizada o localizado en el Centro Histórico. ¿Qué pasa si hay un perro perdido dentro del metro? It will be sent to the Centro de Transferencia Canina where they will take care of it until they find him a new home. Algo que no me gusta del metro es que no hay botes de basura. No, esperen, no es que no me guste, lo odio, lo odio. Odio que en el metro de la Ciudad de México no haya botes de basura. O sea... There are plenty of vendors inside the cars of the metro. You might hear them, you know, they'll be like, en esta ocasión le vengo trayendo, le venimos ofreciendo chocolates, le traemos pegamento, le traemos engrapadoras, libro de matemáticas. It's okay, I don't expect you to understand all of that. That was too fast, I'm crazy. Yeah, but all of these vendors, all of, all of them, my favorite is the one that sells like stops. Yeah, you call that that little thingy that in the back of um, of earrings. That guy or, or that girl, you know, they're geniuses. They always sell a lot because somehow we are always in need of those little back thingies. Comprando un billete. No matter if you are taking an inner city bus or a long distance bus, necesitarás un billete. In this video lesson, I will be speaking specifically about taking a bus in Mexico. And here you have three options to buy a ticket. En línea, en la taquilla de la central de autobús, directamente con el conductor. Imagine you are at La Parada de Autobús and the driver will help you to buy your inner city ticket just like this. Hola, un boleto para ir al centro, por favor. Son 20 pesos. No estoy seguro a dónde tengo que bajarme. No te preocupes, güera. Yo te aviso cuando estemos cerca. Pero de aquí al centro son como 15 minutos. ¡Qué amable! Muchas gracias. What a nice chofer, right? But what about if instead you are at la terminal de autobuses? Let's have a look at the following conversation. Hola. Necesito un boleto para la Ciudad de México. ¿A qué hora sale el siguiente autobús? Claro. El siguiente es uh, a las 2 de la tarde. 
¿Le gustaría un boleto para esa corrida? Sí, me parece muy bien. ¿Podría darme dos boletos, por favor? Preferentemente a la mitad del autobús. Perfecto. Necesito una identificación y va a pagar con tarjeta o en efectivo. En efectivo. Gracias. Mire, aquí tiene. Muy bien. Aquí están sus boletos para abordar el autobús. Le recuerdo que si va a documentar equipaje, deberá entregárselo al chofer del autobús antes de abordar. Excelente. Te agradezco por tu atención, ¿eh? De nada, que tenga buen viaje. Don't get scammed. Si es tu primera vez tomando el autobús en México, make sure you're using the correct website to do this, such as ADO, Estrella Roja, Primera Plus, and so on. If you can go to la terminal de autobuses, then you can buy them online directly on their websites. But if you talk cara a cara con un vendedor, then you will need chunks like ¿Dónde está la taquilla? ¿Puedo hablar con tu gerente? ¿Puedes repetir más despacio, por favor? ¿Cuántas paradas hace el autobús? ¿A qué hora llegaríamos al destino final? These will be useful when trying to buy a ticket at the counter. If you need more useful chunks in Spanish that you can use all the time when speaking to natives, then make sure to download our free Spanish chunking kit. And the link is in the description. Did you notice I said tomar el autobús and not coger el autobús? Even though we will understand in Mexico what are you referring to, te lo advierto. Coger in Mexico is not the same as Spain. So if you want to avoid being teased by the bus driver, please ensure to use tomar el autobús. Asking for help. All right, so finally you have your ticket and it is time for you to tomar tu primer autobús en México. It doesn't matter if it's for a long distance or inner city trips. Here are some useful chunks you will need or that you might hear from el chofer del autobús. Su boleto, por favor. Claro, aquí tiene. Disculpe, señor, tengo una pregunta. Sí, dígame. La chica de la taquilla me dijo que este autobús realiza diferentes paradas. Así es, tenemos cinco diferentes paradas. ¿Usted a dónde va? Yo voy a Chetumal. Ah, Chetumal. Es la tercera parada. Voy a estar anunciando por el micrófono las paradas. Solo tiene que estar usted atento, ¿eh? Ah, muy bien. Entonces estaré al pendiente. Ahora, que tenga buen viaje. Recap. The most important chunks. So here are the most important chunks, again, that you will definitely need when riding the bus. La parada de autobús. Un boleto para... And then you say whatever city you want to go. ¿Cuánto es? De aquí al centro son como 15 minutos. La terminal de autobuses. ¿A qué hora sale el siguiente autobús? ¿Le gustaría un boleto para esa corrida? ¿Dónde está la taquilla? ¿Puedo hablar con tu gerente? ¿Cuántas paradas hace el autobús? ¿A qué hora llegaríamos al destino final? Antes del viaje, before the trip. Asking for information. Mis amigos, two basic questions para la persona de atención a clientes. For the customer service person. ¿A qué hora sale el tren a Barcelona? At what time does the train to Barcelona depart? And you could hear an answer like a las 10 y cuarto de la mañana. At 10.15 a.m. ¿Cuándo es el próximo tren hacia Madrid? When is the next train to Madrid? 
El próximo tren a Madrid es a las 4 de la tarde. The next train to Madrid is at 4 p.m. By the way, ¿a qué hora? Is a perfect example of a chunk in Spanish. A word combination that never changes and that you should just learn by heart so it rolls off your tongue while speaking Spanish. And you don't have to think about grammar or which preposition to use. The easiest way to discover such chunks is not by learning words and grammar, but by listening to Spanish native speakers actually speak Spanish. After all, you know that everything you hear me or other native speakers say sound natural and correct. If you'd like to learn more about learning Spanish root chunks, register for the free chunking training we have on our website. Link is inside the description. Anyway, back to the train station. Buying your tickets from the salesperson. ¿Cuánto cuesta? How much does it cost? ¿Aceptan tarjeta de crédito? Do you take credit card? And don't forget to always say gracias at the end. What about if you're buying from a machine? Usually there will be a translated version, but come on, don't be lame and cheat by switching the machine language to English. You want to brag about your Spanish skills, don't you? Here are some chunks you might read on the machine. Empezar, start, comprar un billete o boleto, buy a ticket, pagar, pay, cancelar, cancel, regresar, go back. This one actually is really useful in case you are not sure, so you can go back and start all over again. Durante el viaje, while traveling. Well, you finally have tu boleto para viajar en tren, your ticket to travel by train, and it is almost time to hop on. But wait, you're a bit lost. Then let's learn the chunks that you need to find your way. Finding the right platform, vehicle, or track. Disculpe, señor o señorita, ¿Dónde está la plataforma, el vagón, número? Excuse me, sir, miss. Where is the platform or vehicle number? Finding your seat. Estoy buscando el asiento número 25A. I am looking for the seat number 25A. Ventana o pasillo? Window or aisle? And what about you having your ticket checked? So you're meeting el controlador? Then, he or she might ask for your ticket like this. ¿Puedo ver su boleto, por favor? And then, you would reply, Sí, aquí tiene. Yes, there you have it. Después del viaje, after the trip. So, you're finally at your destino final, final destination, and you want to make sure it's the right stop, right? Then, you could ask, ¿Esta es la estación de Puebla? Is this the Puebla station? Now it's time to go out of the station and maybe ask for the taxi stop. In this case, you would say, ¿Dónde está la parada de taxis? Where is the taxi stop? Or maybe you got yourself an Uber or a Lyft and you might have to speak with the taxi driver as well. But that, my friends, I will leave it for another video. Let's do a quick recap of what we have learned today. ¿A qué hora sale el tren a? And then you will add the name of the city. At what time does the train to, name of the city, depart? ¿Cuándo es el próximo tren hacia? When is the next train to? ¿Cuánto cuesta? How much does it cost? ¿Aceptan tarjeta de crédito? Do you accept credit card payments? ¿Dónde está la plataforma o el vagón número? Where is the platform or vehicle number? Estoy buscando el asiento número 25A. I am looking for the seat number 25A. Ventana o pasillo? Window or aisle? ¿Puedo ver su billete? Can I see your ticket? Esta es la estación de... Um, is this the um, station? ¿Dónde está la parada de taxis? Where is the taxi stop? Buscando un taxi. Finding a taxi. In Mexico, there are a couple of ways you can get a taxi from. Uh, I think the most common is going to La Parada de Taxis, the taxi stop, and this could be found either on the street or maybe outside a hotel or restaurant. But if you can find any, you may ask the following. ¿Dónde está La Parada de Taxis más cercana? Where is the closest taxi stop? 
Otra forma de conseguir taxis, another way to get a taxi, es by llamando por teléfono a la estación, calling the taxi station. In that case, you could say, Hola, ¿me puedes enviar un taxi a la dirección Reforma 55, por favor? Hi, may I have a taxi sent to the address Reforma 55, please? A la dirección, to the address, is a perfect example of a chunk that never changes, and you should learn it by heart. You shouldn't be thinking about which preposition to use or which gender direction is in Spanish. Bypass all that by memorizing it as a whole. Another way to find a taxi is por una app, through an app. In Mexico City, for example, there are a lot of options like Uber, Jaxi, Cabify. However, watch out because if you go to small cities, like for example mine, I just found out that Uber is coming, so we're still far ahead. In that case, I would recommend you to use any of the options I mentioned before. But you may also hail a taxi by raising your hand, but I think that it's always the safest option to call una compañía de taxis, a taxi company. And I suggest that before you go into your destination in any of the Spanish-speaking countries, you do a bit of research about which apps or which taxi companies are the safest to use And like that, you can avoid any non-desirable situation. Pedir que te lleven a tu destino. Asking to be taken to your destination. So there you are, you find yourself inside the taxi. And the first thing that el taxista, taxi driver, will ask you is, Señor or señorita, ¿dónde lo llevo? Or, ¿dónde quiere que lo lleve? That means, sir or miss, where shall I take you? Or where do you want me to take you? In that case, you should answer. Hola, señor, ¿podría llevarme al aeropuerto? Or wherever you want to go. Hi, sir, could you take me to the airport? And what about if you need to get there really fast? Then, try saying this. Por cierto, tengo un poco de prisa. ¿Podríamos tomar la ruta más rápida, por favor? I'm in a bit of a hurry. Could you take the fastest route, please? Tengo un poco de prisa. I'm in a bit of a hurry. Or simply, tengo prisa. I'm in a hurry, It's another good example of a chunk. Learn it by heart as a whole so it rolls to the tongue whenever you need to tell someone you are busy. By the way, if you'd like to discover the full four-step method to learn to speak Spanish entirely through chunks, check out the free Spanish training we have on our website where we explain how it works and give you a full demo. Link is inside the description. So what about if your tax is going too fast? Then you could say, ¿Podría manejar más despacio, por favor? Could you drive slower, please? And if you need to know the form of payments, which I recommend that you do that in advance, then ask the driver, ¿Acepta pagos con tarjeta? Do you take car payments? And if the driver says, no, solo efectivo, no, only cash, Then try to ask them kindly. ¿Podría parar en un cajero automático, por favor? Could you stop at an ATM, please? Also be aware that there are some taxis in Mexico that do not use taximeter, so make sure to know the price in advance. Like that you will know precisely how much you're paying or maybe you need to negociar el precio, bargain the price. For example, check out the following conversation. Señor, ¿Cuánto cuesta ir de aquí al centro? Sir, how much does it cost to go from here to the city center? Cuesta como 500 pesos. It costs like 500 pesos. Uf, no. Eso está muy caro. Ayer me cobraron 350. Uf, no. That is too expensive. Yesterday I was charged 350. Lo siento. Lo más barato es 400 pesos. I'm sorry, the cheapest is 400 pesos. Ok, muchas gracias. Esperaré otro. Ok, thank you very much. I will wait for another one. Believe me, if you're a good negociador, then you will get your price. And if the taxi does have a taxi meter, please remind them to turn it on by saying, ¿Podría encender el taxímetro, por favor? Could you switch on the mirror, please? Tener una conversación con el conductor. Having a conversation with the driver. This 
is of course entirely optional. I personally like to ask taxi driver for advice when I am in another country as a tourist. You know that it's a fact that the taxi drivers always know the best and cheapest place to eat local food. Therefore, if you want to ask this while you are as a tourist, you might say, Disculpe, señor, ¿qué lugar recomienda para comer? Excuse me, sir, which place do you recommend to eat? Que tenga las tres Bs, bueno, bonito y barato. It needs to have the three Bs, good, nice and cheap. Well, in English, there are not three Bs, but it makes sense in Spanish, no? <laughs> you could also ask questions to the driver like, ¿Qué lugares me recomienda visitar? What places do you recommend to visit? ¿A qué lugares van los locales normalmente? Which places do locals usually go to? And um, by the way, you might have a chatty driver, as in Mexico at least, it is common that they speak to you, unless you decide not to. Or the driver might be de mal humor, in a bad mood. El pago y llegada a tu destino. The payment and arrival to your destination. Just as a reminder, make sure that if you're paying with a card that you have asked this in advance. For some reason, this makes the driver very upset if you don't have cash, um, they don't want to take car payment option or they do not have them. But if you have already discussed this in advance, then expect the driver to say, Ya llegamos, son 65 pesos. We have arrived or we are here, it is 65 pesos. Then you can just simply reply with, aquí tiene, there you have it. Muchas gracias y que tenga un buen día. Thank you very much and have a nice day. By the way, don't forget your luggage in the trunk. Remember you were going to the airport? So remind the driver by saying, ¿Podría abrir la cajuela, por favor? Could you open the trunk, please? And please, if you negotiated a price and for some reason your taxi driver has Alzheimer and says suddenly more, then you should say, Me dijo que costaría 100 pesos y eso voy a pagar. You told me it would cost me 100 pesos, so that's what I'm going to pay. For that matter, if you're using local taxis, my advice is to always carry cash in small bills to avoid drivers tricking you. So in Mexico, taxi drivers might help you with your luggage, but tipping is optional. Si quieres darle propina a tu chofer, if you would like to tip your driver, you can give them 10 or 15 percent. 10 to 15 percent. So here is the scenario. You are at the local market and you try to convince me to reduce the price for you. Here's the deal. You're coming to my store and I will try to sell you things at a high price. You will try to get me to lower the price. After I say something, you will have some time to think of an answer. Then my colleague Silvia will provide an answer. And yes, she will get me to lower my price. Are you ready? Pásele, pásele, güerito, pásele. Gracias. Buenas tardes. Por preguntar no se cobra. ¿Andaba buscando algo en particular? Mm, no, no. Solo ando viendo. Bueno, güero, puede preguntar sin compromiso, ¿eh? ¿Tiene artesanías que tenga las tres Bs? ¡Claro! Aquí solo bueno, bonito y barato. Mire, en la esquina de allá tenemos artesanías 100% mexicanas. Vaya, vaya a ver, vaya. ¡Ah! Pero esas están re caras. Mm, ando buscando artesanías con precio para paisanos. Híjole, güero. Me la pone difícil. Además, usted no parece mexicano, ¿eh? Mire que está más blanquito que yo. Bueno. 
Bueno, a ver, me gustó este. ¿Cuánto es lo menos? Uy, joven, de por sí está re barato. Pero bueno, se la puedo dejar en 500 pesos. No, hombre. En el otro puesto tenían algo similar en 350 pesos. Seguro está hecho en China ese. Ese es producto 100% mexicano, ¿eh? ¡Hala! Es que no me alcanza. ¿Me podría dar algún descuento? ¡Ujule, uh, joven! ¿Le voy a perder? Pero mire, ni usted ni yo. ¿Qué le parece 450? ¿Sabe qué? Mejor voy a seguir viendo. Apenas es la segunda tienda que visito. A ver, espere, joven, espere. Es que con uno no me sale. Pero si se lleva dos, pues se lo puedo dejar en 400 cada uno. ¿Cómo ve? Yo solo quiero uno, pero ya aquí en Caliente le doy los 400 por ese. ¿Qué tal? Sale, le acepto los 400. You made it! Well done! Let's have a look at more chunks to bargain in Spanish now. By the way, you may download the list of essential chunks from the link that you can find in the description below to get even more useful chunks in Spanish that you can use in conversations right away. Now, let's take note of the following. ¿Me puede dar un mejor precio? ¿Me podría dar algún descuento? ¿Estaría dispuesto a bajarlo a 20 pesos? ¿Me la o me lo dejaría en 10 pesos? For this chunk in particular, you need to use the correct noun gender. So if you're buying, let's say, una mascada, then you will have to say, ¿me la dejaría en 10 pesos? But if you're buying, let's say, un teléfono, then you must change it to, me lo dejaría en 10 pesos. That's actually a very cheap phone. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Le doy cinco pesos. <laughs> Uy, no. Ya no traigo tanto dinero, eh. No me alcanza. Disculpe, pero... No me alcanza. ¿Sabe qué? En otra tienda lo vi más barato, ¿eh? By the way, you can say tienda or puesto. Those are synonyms. Say más barato or económico. Next chunk es... Déjeme seguir viendo a ver si lo encuentro más económico por ahí. Sale, gracias, ¿eh? Voy a seguir viendo. Pero si no encuentro nada, regreso contigo. And your lifesaver. ¿Cuánto es lo menos? ¿Y si llevo dos? ¿Cuánto? Número uno, number one. Colombia, ¿ok? Not Colombia. Colombia is an Ivy League university in New York. Colombia is the land of Gabriel Garcia Márquez and Vallenato. I've heard this mistake all the time in series, in movies, y esto tiene que parar. This has got to stop. It's Colombia. Also, since we're in Colombia, let's check this out. It's Barranquilla, not Barranquilla or anything else. Also, it's Bogotá, not Bogota or Bogota or any other thing. And also Medellín, not Medellín or Medellín. I've heard this one too. Número dos, México. So I opened this video with the example of México. Mexico, Mexico. Don't say Mexico, it's Mexico. It's very common that people call it Mexico, and that's because, well, that's how it will sound in English. But in Español es 
México. In Spanish is México. It's a very common mistake to mispronounce letter X in Español. And this is because sometimes the sound changes. Sometimes it sounds like a J, sometimes it sounds like an S. Take these two words, for example. Xochimilco and Michiote. In the first one, it sounds like S. In the second one, it sounds like CH. The reason for this is that a lot of words in Spanish actually come from indigenous languages and therefore the sounds of the letter X may vary. Maybe I should make a video about those words in Spanish that come from indigenous languages. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Refresca tus conocimientos, refresh your knowledge of the correct pronunciation of the Spanish alphabet with Mariana's videos on that subject. A few places in Mexico that are often mispronounced are Oaxaca, Tijuana, and Quintana Roo. This one is very important because this is the state where Cancun is and I love Cancun. Número tres. Number three, Argentina. Remember that the letra G, that letter G, in Spanish sounds like H when it goes before letter E and letter E, like in this case. So we say Argentina, not Argentina. And since we're in the topic, it's Córdoba, not Cordoba. <laughs> and also it's pronounced Buenos Aires, which literally means good airs. But you know, Buenos Aires, the super, super famous city in Argentina. Número cuatro, number four. It's Cuba, not Cuba, all right? Also, Cuba is the name of a super famous cocktail, you know, rum and coke and ice and good times. That's a Cuba as well. And since we are on the topic of Cuba, it's pronounced Habana or, you know, La Habana, not Havana, all right? Habana. It's Habana because recuerda que la H es muda. Remember that letter H is silent. Okay, so we say Honduras, not Honduras. Also, we say Haiti, not Haiti. Número cinco. Number five. Anything with the word Puerto. Por favor, repite después de mí. Please repeat after me. Puerto, not puero, all right? So we say Puerto Vallarta. Remember that double L has that J sound? Puerto Vallarta, Puerto Escondido. And here, remember that letter D sounds like in dentist, so it's like a bit hard. Puerto Escondido. And Puerto Rico. Alemán. German. El alemán se habla en Alemania. German is spoken in Germany. By the way, this is the chunk that we use to say that a certain language is spoken in a certain country. For example, en Blank space, se habla blank space. Árabe, Arabic. El árabe se habla en más de 40 países. Arabic is spoken in over 40 countries. Checo, Czech. El checo se habla en República Checa. Czech is spoken in Czech Republic. Coreano, Korean. El coreano se habla tanto en el norte como en el sur de Corea. Korean is spoken in both North and South Korea. Chino, Chinese. El chino es el idioma más antiguo del mundo. Chinese is the oldest language in the world. Euskera, Basque. This one I just learned it is not Vasco, but Euskera. Y es un idioma que se habla al norte de España. It is a language spoken 
in the north of Spain. ¿Quién lo hubiera pensado? Who would have thought? Francés. French. El francés es uno de los idiomas más románticos del mundo. French is one of the most romantic languages of the world. Flowing down a, a, a slooping thing. Griego. Greek. El griego es un idioma que se habla desde hace más de 3400 años. Greek is a language spoken for over 3400 years. Hebreo. Hebrew. El hebreo comúnmente se considera como un idioma sagrado. Hebrew is commonly considered a sacred language. Holandés, Dutch. El holandés es un idioma oficial de la Unión Europea. Dutch is an official language of the European Union. Italiano, Italian. El italiano es una lengua romance. Italian is a romance language. Una otra vuelta, más de eso vorrei propio sentir la música de las palabras. Margarete. Japonés. Japanese. El japonés es el idioma que más rápido se habla en el mundo. Japanese is one of the fastest spoken languages in the world. Noruego. Norwegian. El noruego es una lengua escandinava. Norwegian is a Scandinavian language. Polaco, Polish. El idioma polaco es rico en sonidos. The Polish language is rich in sounds. Portugués, Portuguese. En Portugal y en Brasil se habla portugués. In Portugal and Brazil, Portuguese is spoken. Now, proceda, você é realmente un profesor fabuloso. Oh. Ahora que estoy haciendo. Búlgaro. Bulgarian. El búlgaro es un dialecto del eslavo. Bulgarian is a Slavic dialect. Turco. Turkish. El turco es uno de los idiomas más antiguos de la humanidad. Turkish is one of the oldest languages of mankind. finding a home. I have decided to move to the beautiful city of Mexico City and I have to make sure to find the appropriate home or apartment to settle in. Muy probablemente tendrás que reunirte con agentes de bienes raíces. So, here's an example of a conversation you could have with them. Hola, ¿me puede compartir qué está buscando en una casa? Gracias. Me gustaría tener un departamento con dos habitaciones, mira, como este. También, también me gustó este. Como este. Que tenga dos baños y también preferentemente cerca del centro de la ciudad, acá. Claro que sí. Si tiene tiempo ahorita, podemos ir a hacer algunas visitas. ¡Ah, perfecto! Me parece muy bien. Vamos, sí, vamos, tengo tiempo. Vamos. This is just an example, but if you want to know more about house features, I did a lesson on how to talk about furniture. Check it out here. <laughs> Exploring the city. The most amazing feeling when you are settled in your future home. ¿A poco no? Estoy segura que una vez que ya tienes casa, ahora es Tiempo de explorar la ciudad y sus alrededores. First advice, no tengas miedo en preguntar. If you're living in an apartment, you might have the chance to speak to a receptionist, concierge, or a doorman. In that case, use your Spanish and ask things like, Disculpe, señor o señorita, ¿qué hay cerca de aquí? ¿Es seguro caminar por aquí? 
a cualquier hora del día? ¿Dónde está el súper o la farmacia más cercana? Chunk alert, ¿dónde está? Is a super useful chunk in Spanish that you should learn by heart as a whole. You will be able to use it in many different sentences like ¿Dónde está la farmacia? Or, very important, ¿Dónde está el mejor puesto de tacos? That, take note, right? You need that one a lot. <laughs> You're still learning how to ask for directions? Then check out my lesson for specific chunks you need when asking for directions in any Spanish-speaking country. Speaking with locals. All right, you don't have a concierge because you live in a private or rented house, but you have something called los vecinos. Y sinceramente, los vecinos pueden ser de gran ayuda. Unless they are you know, the, the noisy kind, pero solo es una broma. So, how can you approach them? Hola vecina, ¿cómo está? Sí, yo soy María y acabo de mudarme a la ciudad. Hola vecina, ¿qué tal? Mucho gusto. ¿Dónde es usted? Ah, yo soy de los Estados Unidos, pero siempre me gustó México. Oye, pero no me hable de usted, puedes hablarme de tú. Pues bienvenida entonces. Si necesitas ayuda, solo échame un grito para que con gusto te apoye. Ay, qué linda, muchas gracias. Adiós. If you say this to a local, then you're giving them permission to approach you in a friendly and informal manner. Ah, yo soy de los Estados Unidos, pero siempre me gustó México. Pero no me hable de usted, puedes hablarme de tú. By the way, to make sure you know all the useful chunks you will need in your conversations with your neighbors, download your free Spanish chunking kit. It contains several cheat sheets with useful Spanish chunks and the link is in the description. That wasn't that hard, right? But what about if it's a stranger from a restaurant, pub, or even on the street? How would you approach a local without being too creepy or rude? Let's see the following conversation. Hola, disculpa, ¿me puedes ayudar? Sí, claro, ¿qué necesitaba? Lo que pasa es que recién me mudé a la ciudad y no conozco mucho los alrededores y quisiera saber si pudieses darme unos tips. Claro que sí, de comida, de vivienda, de seguridad. ¿Tal vez un poco de todo? Ah, sí, fíjate. La neta, qué buena onda son los mexicanos, ¿eh? Muchas gracias por todo. Sí, y ya tienes mi número por cualquier cosa. ¿Me escribes o me llamas? So, if you approach people in the correct and polite manner, they will definitely help you, and if you're lucky enough like this girl, probably you will end up making some friends. The most important is to know the chunks that you need to request information, advice, or just help. By the way, I have made a video about how to ask for help in Spanish too, that you can go and watch right after this lesson. But before that, to end this lesson, do you know the chunks to ask for advice? At this moment, you should be writing down all the new vocabulary and phrases you have learned so far. Here are an extra five. ¿Me recomendarías este restaurante? Número dos. ¿Podrías sugerirme algo para hacer esta noche? Número tres. ¿Dónde puedo tomar clases de piano? Número cuatro. ¿Cómo le hago para rentar un carro? Y número cinco. ¿Te molestaría darme un tour por la ciudad? Número uno. ¿Qué estás haciendo en México? Posibles respuestas. Visitando, estoy trabajando, me vine a vivir aquí hace un año, or X amount of years. Me vine a vivir aquí hace dos años, me vine a vivir aquí hace tres años. Número dos, ¿estás aquí solo o con tu familia? Posibles respuestas. Estoy aquí sola, mi familia está en Nueva York. Estoy aquí con mi familia. Número 3. 
¿Te gusta la comida mexicana? Well, here it's really important that if you actually don't like Mexican food, just keep it to yourself. ¿Por qué? Pues porque los mexicanos somos muy sensibles sobre nuestra comida. Y vamos a pensar que debe haber algo raro sobre ti si no te gusta nuestra maravillosa comida. Only acceptable answers. Me encanta. Sí, me gusta mucho. Now, you can use this one when you are really not that crazy about Mexican food. Sí, me gusta, pero casi no la puedo comer por mi estómago. Es muy sensible. Número 4. ¿Qué te gusta más? What do you like more? And of course, this is a continuation of the previous question about Mexican food. Ejemplos. Los tacos al pastor. Los tamales. El mole. El pozole. Now, if you're that mm, peculiar person who doesn't like Mexican food, you can answer with this. Las quesadillas de solo queso con guacamole. This is a great answer because you're letting them know that you like simple flavors and that way they won't offer you anything crazy, you know, like tacos de tripa or tacos de sesos. You also get additional points because, well, we all Mexicans, we all love uh, a simple cheese quesadilla with guacamole. So there, you know, you're still an acceptable human. ¿Te está gustando este video? Si es así, dime en los comentarios y si no, well, also let me know. I want to know what I'm doing wrong and how can I be better for you. Número 5. ¿Qué piensas de los mexicanos? Son muy buenas personas. Son muy cálidos y amables. Son maravillosos. Son. They are. Remember that in Spanish the verb to be is kind of like split in two. Ser and estar. And in this case, because we're talking about characteristics, we use ser. Which is also used to talk about occupation, origin, time, and well, you don't really have to learn this. Well, don't try to think too much about it because it's only going to drive you crazy to, you know, try to remember all of these rules. We don't do this at Spring Spanish. Instead, we use conversation-based chunking, which is a system that allows people to speed their way into fluency. To learn more about it and download our Essential Spanish Chunking Kit, click on the description. There is a link there. Click it. Get your free copy right now. Número 6. ¿Te está gustando México? Are you liking Mexico? Or are you liking, you know, Chile? Or are you liking Colombia? Possible answers. Sí, me está encantando. Sí, me fascina. ¿Te está gustando este video? Well, make sure you stay until the end because I am going to test if you're actually paying attention and learning something. Número 7. ¿Cuál es tu lugar favorito en México? Possible answers. Cancún, la ciudad de México. No tengo favorito, todo me gusta. Ahora, una gran pregunta para preguntarle a la otra persona. ¿Qué lugares me recomiendas? Número 8. ¿Cómo te está yendo con el español? Possible answers. No muy bien, pero quiero mejorar. Más o menos. Bien, pero me falta mucho. Número 9. ¿Ya fuiste a Chapultepec? Have you gone to... And then insert the place. Posibles respuestas. No, todavía no, pero tengo ganas. Sí, ya fui. Me encantó. ¿Ya fuiste a Xcaret? No, todavía no, pero tengo ganas. ¿Ya fuiste a Tepoztlán? Sí, ya fui. Me encantó. Número 10. ¿Qué lugares has conocido? Here's where you're going to list all the places that you have visited and you're going to start it with this phrase. Ya fui a... Ya fui a Teotihuacán, ya fui a Xochimilco, ya fui al Centro Histórico y ya fui a Tepoztlán. 
¿Qué tal si todavía no has ido a ningún lugar interesante? Then you could say, todavía no conozco mucho, pero tengo muchas ganas. ¿Qué lugares me recomiendas? Número 11. Quiz time. Now let's see if you've actually learned something, mi gente. And I've included a tricky question to see if you can answer it. ¿Qué estás haciendo en México? ¿Qué lugares has conocido? ¿Qué te gustó más? ¿Te gusta la comida mexicana? ¿Qué te gusta más? ¿Estás aquí solo o con tu familia? Número 1. Carnes raras. Strange meats. El primer paquete que viste eran pescuezos de pollo. El segundo eran mollejas. El tercero era chicharrón prensado. El cuarto era chorizo verde. Y el último era panza. Because in a regular diet we Mexicans include some strange meats, it's not surprised that you will find them in supermarkets as well. Sometimes the pre-packed meat packages, they can... No, the pre-packed packages. What am I, what am I thinking? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what I mean to say is that, that the pre-packed meat can be a little too much, can be too heavy. But no te preocupes. Porque las amables personas que trabajan en la carnicería te pueden ayudar a empacar exactamente la cantidad que tú necesites. Learn this. Me podría dar... And then you insert the amount and type of meat that you want. Remember that in Mexico we use the metric system. Let's use it in two examples. Disculpe, ¿me podría dar medio kilo de milanesa de res? Disculpe, ¿me podría dar un kilo de costilla de cerdo? That's right. Díganme en los comentarios cuál de las carnes raras que les mencioné debería de comprar la siguiente vez que vaya al supermercado. I'll cook it, I'll show you how I cook it, and of course I'll share the final result of me eating it. Here at the Spring Spanish YouTube channel, to which you should subscribe right now. Subscribe. Suscríbete, ándale, suscríbete. Número 2. Está bien si no puedes esperar. <laughs> It's okay if you can't wait. ¿Se acuerdan de mi amiga Kaichin? I told you about her in my other video, where I discuss things that foreigners find weird about Mexico. That's the video. If you haven't watched it, go watch it right after this one. All right, so I asked Kai Chin what she thought about, you know, like weird things that Mexicans do. And she pointed out this thing that we do at supermarkets. Here's what she said. La gente puede abrir los snacks y comer mientras hace compras y antes de ir a pagar. <laughs> It's true. Y siempre pienso que si la gente acaba de snack y tira el empaque, pues ya no es necesario pagar. So, yeah, in Mexico, sometimes people do open their drinks and snacks before they pay them. I'm not saying that this is what every Mexican does, but it's true that it happens and no one is ever going to, like, tell you anything about it. I mean, you know what? Maybe now it's not the time to be eating inside of supermarkets. But it does happen. It happens particularly as people wait in line, you know, at the cashiers. Yeah, some people will grab una coca y unas sabritas y se las comen en lo que esperan a pagar. Like I said, I'm not encouraging this type of behavior, eating inside the supermarket before paying for things. Especially now that we have to wear this when we go to the supermarket. Yeah, I think eating inside a supermarket is off limits now, so if you see someone doing it, maybe you could say this. Disculpe, el tapabocas. Yeah, bien puesto. But one day everything is gonna come back to normal and we're gonna be eating our sabritas in el super antes de pagarlas. Si lo vas a hacer, por favor, no tires el paquete y págalo. Hay un código de honor que tenemos que respetar. Número 3. Servicios extras en la caja. En México no se tienen que pesar las frutas y las verduras antes de pagarlas. En el área de frutas y verduras vas a encontrar algunas pesas para verificar el peso de tus productos. Pero, a diferencia de otros países, no tienes que imprimir una etiqueta antes de pagar los productos, las frutas y las verduras. Eso se hace directamente en la caja. 
Other things that Mexicans can do at the cashier in a supermarket, withdraw money from your card, pay utilities, like lots of utilities, like you can pay all of your utilities there. And you can also buy data for your mobile. Not bad, right? Pay attention, because at the beginning of the transaction, the cashier might ask you, ¿Tiene tarjeta de puntos? Sí, claro. And also pay attention at the end of the transaction, because that's when the cashier might ask you if you want some of the additional services that that supermarket offers. For example, ¿Va a retirar? No, gracias. ¿Alguna recarga? Sí, por favor, al 99-81-07-07-07. That's right. Número 4. Salsas y frutas y verduras maravillosas. Salsas and amazing produce. It's Mexico, so there will be lots of chilies everywhere. And the supermarket is no exception. Look at this. Tenemos chile pasilla, chile de árbol, chile habanero, chile jalapeño, chile poblano, todos los chiles. Expert tip. Salsas, bottle salsas, are an excellent souvenir to bring back home and you can buy them, tons of them, in any supermarket. Just pack them properly. Una de las mejores salsas embotelladas es la salsa chimay. De verdad sabe como una salsa hecha a mano y lo mejor de todo es que en la etiqueta viene un poema. If you want to tell someone what your favorite salsa is, say it like this. Mi salsa favorita es la chimay. Uy, sí, me encanta. A mí también me encanta. Other than all kinds of peppers, you will also find amazing fruit like mamey, and guayabas, and mangos, like this ones. El mango atabulfo, el mejor mango del mundo. Definitivamente el mejor mango del mundo. Es delicioso. También vas a encontrar algunas frutas y verduras un poco exóticas, como la flor de la jamaica o los nopales. Número 5. Etiquetas de advertencia. El impuesto del azúcar. This is a brand new thing. So, Mexico is among the top countries in obesity, like metabolic syndrome and child obesity. Yeah, it, it's, not a, it's not a great thing, but it's our reality. Y como eso no está nada bien, en un esfuerzo para informar mejor a la gente sobre lo que consumen, now in Mexico, it is mandatory for all processed foods to come with warning labels. So yeah, the warning labels are there in an effort to help people make better decisions. So for example, we have Valentina, my beloved Valentina that I put on popcorn and everything else. Um, and it has an exceso de sodio. Yes, it has una etiqueta de exceso de sodio and that means it has too much sodium, but I'm still gonna eat it. Also, now in Mexico, it's against the law to have cartoon-like images in the packaging of products that are aimed at children. So, olvídense de ver al elefante Melvin o al tigre Toño en las cajas de cereales en México porque ya no existen. Ya pasaron. Número 6. Tortillas frescas y más. Cuando yo era una niña, iba todos los días a las tortillas. O sea, a la tortillería a comprar tortillas. Mi familia consumía todos los días dos kilos de tortillas. Las tortillas son una parte muy importante en la vida diaria de los mexicanos. Supermarkets nowadays have a small tortillería inside so you can buy your tortillas while you do the rest of your groceries for your convenience. So yeah, you can buy freshly made tortillas in a Mexican supermarket and not only that, but all kind of corn-based products. If you're not sure about the full range of products, you might want to ask one of the staff members this. Disculpe, aparte de tortillas, ¿qué otros productos de maíz venden? Mmm, very good. And then you can have Totopos, tortillas con sabor a nopal, sopes para preparar, tlacoyos para preparar, tortillas en juliana, etc, etc, etc. And while you're there, grab this and get yourself some pan dulce. En México, la tortillería y la panadería siempre están juntas.
¿De dónde eres? Where are you from? You could say more than just, yo soy de los Estados Unidos. I am from the United States. I want you to feel confident next time you want to share some fun facts about your country or yourself. So, ¿estás listo? Let's start with some basics. I'm going to teach you some chunks that you can use immediately. Vamos a empezar. Let's start. Número uno, yo soy de los Estados Unidos. I am from the United States. Or, yo soy estadounidense. This means that you have a U.S. nationality. This is way better or the correct way when you refer where are you from, rather than saying, yo soy americano, I am American. This could be a bit confusing because canadienses, mexicanos, argentinos, brasileños, and so on, we are Americans as well. So if you really want to feel proud about the country where you are from, rather than your continent, which I guess it's okay as well, then use yo soy estadounidense. You can complement this chunk by saying yo vivo, which means I live, and then add, for example, the name of el estado, the state. Yo vivo en California. Yo vivo en Texas. Yo vivo en Nueva York. Also, you can refer to a specific area or the size of the place where you live. For example, yo vivo cerca de la playa. I live by the beach. Yo vivo cerca de las montañas. I live by the mountains. Yo vivo en una ciudad. I live in a city. Yo vivo en un pueblo. I live in a town. Let's see the full example. Yo vivo en una ciudad de California, cerca de la playa. I live in a city from California, by the beach. Número 2. La capital de los Estados Unidos es... The capital city of the United States is... Washington, D.C. Número 3. El presidente de los Estados Unidos es... The U.S. president is... And then you add whoever the currently president of the USA is. And because it's an English name, you can use the pronunciation exactly as it is. Número 4. Talking about the national sports. I mean, who doesn't like to brag about the sports that have made USA popular, right? Such as football americano, American football, basketball, baseball, tennis, golf, or even football, which is soccer. I mean, as you can see, there are similarities on the pronunciation in English. You just have to pronounce correctly the vowels like in Spanish. Also, we have the chunk mi equipo deportivo favorito es. My favorite sports team is. And if you want to say only about the sport, you say mi deporte favorito es. And then you can name whatever from the list that I have just told you. Speaking about sports team, you can also say soy fanática de, I'm a fan of, or soy seguidor, if you're a man, or soy seguidora, if you're a woman. Soy seguidora de. And then you would add the name of your sports team. Okay, let's see my personal example. Mi deporte favorito es el basketball y soy fanática de los Lakers. Sorry, haters. Número 5. El día de la independencia es el 4 de julio. Independence Day is on the 4th of July. Nos gusta celebrar con desfiles y fuegos artificiales. We like to celebrate with parades and fireworks. Just as we do, guys. Our Independence Day in Mexico is on September 16. Número 6, speaking about your political parties. En los Estados Unidos, tenemos dos partidos políticos. In the United States, we have two political parties. Los demócratas y los republicanos. The Democrats and the Republicans. If you want to say which political party do you follow, then you would say, yo soy demócrata, 
or Yo Soy Republicano. The symbols for each party, Democrats are represented by un burro, a donkey, and the Republicans by un elefante, an elephant. Número 7, to end this lesson, la comida americana, the American food. And let's be honest, American food is everywhere. So of course, it's part of the culture and you can be a little, you know, to brag about, depending on which state where you're from, that you will have some representative meal that you can talk about. For example, los beignets en Nueva Orleans, the beignets from New Orleans, or la carne de cerdo de Texas, ay, qué rico, the pulled pork from Texas, mm, yummy. Let's see this example. A mí me gustan las hamburguesas de California. I like the hamburgers from California. Y a ti? And you? Let me know in the comments. I really want to know if you have a representative meal from your state. By the way, guys, the following chunks, you can use them as well when you are talking about your hometown. For example, me gusta viajar. I like to travel. Crecí en Las Vegas. I was raised in Vegas. Nací en Houston. I was born in Houston. Me gustaría visitar México. I would like to visit Mexico. Número uno. Key Mexican Expressions. Como la idea es mantener oculto tu estatus de extranjero, te vas a convertir en una persona de pocas palabras. Bad, we're gonna make them count. First, greetings. Just say, buenas. Buenas, that's right. It literally means good ones, but it's code for either buenos días or buenas tardes. It's quite informal and a lot of Mexicans use it, so you will blend in right away. To agree with something or with someone, you can say, okay, yep, that's right, but make sure you pronounce it, you know, like you're Mexican. Okay. And to say goodbye, you can either say hasta luego or you can say bye. Yep, that's right. Mexicans use bye as much as they use hasta luego or adios. If you need to say excuse me, just say comper. That's right, comper, not con permiso, which is the full expression, just Comper. And if somebody says comper or con permiso to you, then you're going to respond with propio. This old fashioned and super Mexican expression is gonna help you stay camouflaged. Comper, propio. That's right. Número dos, eating with tortillas and tacos. Siempre me doy cuenta de que alguien es extranjero por la forma en la que manejan sus tacos. If you were to spend a day as a Mexican, you would definitely include unos taquitos into the mix. Primero, déjame enseñarte cómo usar las tortillas para hacer un taco. Y recuerda que más que un platillo, los tacos son una forma de comer. Nothing will make you look more Mexican than being able to make your own tacos when you are served a dish that comes with tortillas. And this is how you do it. Now, if you are in a taqueria, in a taco stand, you have to know how to order. Aquí tienes una orden promedio. ¿Me da tres de bistec con todo, por favor? Sí, claro, señorita. ¿Y de tomar qué le damos? Una coca, por favor. Just with that phrase, you could survive in Mexico. ¿Me da tres de bistec con todo? And then, here's how you properly prepare a taco. Tienes que poner la salsa a lo largo de toda la tortilla. Lo mismo que el limón, a lo largo. No solo en el centro. Repito, no solo en el centro. That's the typical mistake that foreigners do. Yeah, don't do it. Now, to properly grab a taco, use gravity in your favor and keep this angle. 
I hope you're liking this video as much as I like tacos. <laughs> Do subscribe to the Spring Spanish YouTube channel so we can keep creating content that helps you in your journey to learn el lenguaje más bonito del mundo, que es el español, y todo el mundo lo sabe. Número 3. Prioritize comfort over fashion. Tratándose de la moda, yo estoy convencida de que los mexicanos le damos más importancia a estar cómodos que al estilo. Hey, por favor, mexicanos fashionistas, no me odien. I'm not talking about you and your marvelous sense of style. I'm just talking about, you know, the general public, you know, like me. Yo solo he vivido en dos ciudades de México, en Cancún, mi hermoso pedacito de paraíso, y en la espectacular ciudad de México, donde vivo ahora. En Cancún, todo el mundo usa lentes de sol. Y aquí en la Ciudad de México no tanto, aunque el día esté muy soleado. Pero lo que las dos ciudades tienen en común es que sin importar el clima, todo el tiempo, todo el mundo usa jeans, pantalones de mezclilla. Y de verdad, sin importar el clima, vas a ver pantalones de mezclilla por todos lados. En Cancún, sandals are almost mandatory by the Constitution. Here in Mexico City, you're better off with clothes, shoes, and whatever feels comfortable. Important notes though. En México, usar la bandera nacional fuera de sus fines ceremoniales es un delito. So you will never see a Mexican, at least in Mexico, wearing the flag. So please don't do it. Not only you will be breaking a federal law, but you will also ruin your cover and everybody will know that you're a foreigner. Otra nota importante, la modestia sigue siendo muy importante en México. Eh, short shorts are not that common unless you are um, in a beach town. Spaghetti straps, transparent fabrics or any outfit that reveals a little too much skin might make you stand out and probably you don't want that. So avoid it, particularly if you are in a conservative town. About that and modesty and how it's still important, I'm going to tell you a story in a minute. Número 4. Mexican behaviors. Now, we're going to imagine two situations in which you might find yourself when in Mexico. Situation number one, you are queuing, yeah, queuing, yeah, waiting in line and somebody's trying to cut the line. And situation number two, you're trying to buy something in a market. How would a true Mexican behave in these situations? See, Mexican will never let somebody just cut the line without them saying something. You know, that horrible behavior that goes against all the rules that hold society together. <laughs> so if you are to witness that when in Mexico, you can say, yo estoy formado. Very good. That the way you said it, that's right. Yo estoy formado. Or if you're a woman, yo estoy formada. Yo estoy formada. If you say it with a smile, it works very good as well. Yo estoy formada, eh? You can add the E. Yo estoy formada, eh? <laughs> That's right. So you can say that yo estoy formado or yo estoy formada when somebody is trying to cut the line right in front of you. But if they're not cutting right in front of you, but you're just seeing it happen like from a distance, you can say this phrase and you can... <clears throat> Se cuelan! <laughs> That will be enough to make uh, the person that is trying to cut the line a little embarrassed and probably other people will join you and everybody is going to start like, se cuelan, se cuelan. What about the other situation, being in a market? Well, Mexicans will always try to get a better deal. So let's say you're in a market and you wanna buy a t-shirt, a pot of plan, a handbag, or whatever. You can try this. Disculpe, ¿cuánto cuesta? 80 pesos. ¿Y si me llevo dos? Mm, ok, le doy 2 por 150. Me lo llevo. Now, let's say you bought produce, I don't know, lettuces or tomatoes or whatever you bought. Before the produce is handed to you, tell this to the vendor. Me da el pilón and say with a smile. Me da el pilón. El pilón, el pilón. I love el pilón. El pilón is that extra little bit that vendors give to their frequent clients or to anyone that asks for it, really, if you ask nicely, you know, to keep them coming. I'm pretty sure that if you ask with a smile and with a bright attitude, you're going to get el pilón. So remember I was telling you the thing about modesty? You're not gonna believe what happened to me. I was walking in my neighborhood and <laughs> I was wearing this. 
So, you know, I was like doing my groceries, walking about my neighborhood, and this older lady stands in front of me and says, Mira esta encuerada. Yeah, she called me encuerada. Encuerada, it's like um, slang for naked. That, I was not naked. No, not even close. But this is just to show you that, yeah, modesty still matters in even big cities like Mexico City. Empecemos por tus fotos, porque de la vista nace el amor. When in Mexico, the best practice to pick the perfect profile picture still apply. Así que por favor amigos, en tu foto de perfil no pongas una selfie, no pongas fotos grupales, no pongas fotos borrosas y no enseñes mucha piel. Now, let's get more specific. Cuando escojas tu foto de perfil para el mundo hispanoparlante, be mindful of our culture and our preferences. We're overall quite warm, fun-loving, easygoing people. And we're more family-oriented than folks from the global north. Also, we're very proud of our culture and our national heritage. And most importantly, According to many studies, the one attribute that most Mexicans are looking for when they're using Tinder is not how attractive they find you, but... Lo que la gente busca en México is someone with similar interests. Considerando todo lo anterior, cuando estés swiping en México, asegúrate de que tu foto de perfil te muestre claramente y de preferencia sonriendo. En el resto de tus fotos asegúrate de incluir. Número 1. Incluye una foto de un landmark del país en donde te encuentres. Es una muy buena forma de mostrar, bueno, en primer lugar que estás ahí y además que te le estás pasando bien y que respetas el lugar y la cultura en donde te encuentras. Be mindful, please. You have no idea how many folks think that trespassing or disrespecting a local landmark is a good way to get people to like them on Tinder. Like, seriously? No, señor, no. No, señorita. A mi país lo respetas. A mi país lo respetas. Número dos. Alguna foto con tu familia. But do this only if you actually get along with them. Otherwise, you can use pictures with friends or any situation that show us that you are fun to hang out with or, you know, like somebody that I would like to party with. Yeah, photos with friends work really well too. Since we're on the topic of family, the following is a big no-no in Latin America. You might feel tempted to show how warm of a person you are by holding a baby. Now ask yourself, are you the parent? Are you closely related to the child in question? Entonces, está bien. Pero tu perfil de Tinder is just not the right place to share your life-changing experience working in the Amazons or working with Mayan children in Chiapas. So don't. Why? Well, very simple. This can easily be seen as tokenizing people and, you know, like using people as props. And that's a huge no, no, no. <laughs> No lo hagas. Número 3. Si tienes una mascota, esta es tu oportunidad de mostrársela al mundo. Atención, atención, no dog fishing, please. Only show pictures of that beautiful pet if that cute little one is actually yours. Recuerda que la honestidad es clave. Y además, ni siquiera tienes que mentir. You really don't have to lie. You really don't have to borrow a dog just to look cute on your profile in Tinder. You don't have to do that. Chances are you're gonna do way better in Mexico than you do in your own country. If you wanna know why, bear with me, I'll tell you. Maria Fernanda from Spring Spanish actually asked a bunch of Latinos what they think about dating foreigners. You'll be surprised to hear what they have to say. Find out in her video, the link is up here and in the description. Number four, the most important thing. Make sure you include pictures that showcase your interests. Do you love gardening? I want to see you next to your roses. Are you training for a marathon? Show me a picture of your hamstrings. Your idea of a perfect Sunday is reading in bed all day, eating pizza and drinking mimosas. Show me and invite me. <laughs> 
All right, now that you have your photos selected, let's take a look at your bio, the perfect acerca de mí section. Most important thing, do not leave it blank. Also, don't write too much. Let's aim for a few direct, sweet sentences that best represent who you are and what you're looking for. Here are the three elements that you must add. Elemento número uno, preséntate siendo descriptivo. A good formula to open your bio is this, nationality plus what you're doing in the place plus an allusion to your length of stay. Let's see some real life examples that work very, very well. Australiana viviendo en México desde hace tres años. Estadounidense de negocios en Guadalajara por dos semanas. En México es muy común incluir tu altura en tu bio. Y recuerda que en México utilizamos el sistema métrico. Puedes utilizar la palabra mido. Por ejemplo, yo mido 1.68. I do. I'm a tall bitch. Por el contrario, algo que no es tan común incluir en un perfil de Tinder en México es tu signo zodiacal, pero si para ti es muy importante, ponlo. Puedes usar el siguiente chunk alert. Mi signo es... Mi signo es acuario. Elemento número dos. A reference to your level of Spanish in Spanish, of course. It's okay if you are not an expert. Use the following phrase to let your possible matches know that even if you don't speak Spanish, you care enough to at least let them know. Aunque estoy intentando, todavía no sé hablar español. O hablo poco español. O hablo muy poquito español. If your level of Spanish is higher, good enough to at least carry a conversation on a date, you can write the following. ¿Me ayudas a mejorar mi español? O hablo español bien, pero tenme paciencia, por favor. Uf, this is a good one. Elemento número tres. Be open about what you're looking for. If you're looking for something on the more serious end of the balance, you are already in luck. Why? Because the majority of Tinder users in Mexico actually use it in their search for a relationship. So don't be shy y pon buscando algo serio. Si no estás buscando algo serio, pon buscando algo casual. Recuerda que en México estamos muy interesados en tener intereses similares a nuestros matches, así que incluye actividades que te gustaría compartir con tu date. Por ejemplo, salir a tomar algo, pueblear este fin de semana o ver el atardecer en una terraza. Ah. You can use this phrase to connect your intentions with your interests. Empecemos por ejemplos. Buscando algo serio. Empecemos por salir a tomar algo. Buscando algo casual. Empecemos por ir a pueblear este fin de semana. ¿Recuerdas que te había dicho que es muy posible que te vaya mejor en México que en tu lugar de origen? All right, guys, I'm having a lot of fun making this video and I hope you're enjoying it too. And now it's a good time for you to, I mean, if you're liking the video, please like it and subscribe to the channel for more content from me. No importa cuál sea tu lugar de origen, eres extranjero y eso en México te hace exótico y por lo tanto appealing. As a matter of fact, the Mexican dating scene can be quite benevolent to foreigners as compared to how they would fare in their own country. Perhaps it's your foreign accent. <laughs> Perhaps it's the idea of meeting someone from a faraway exotic land like Swaddling Cove, Derbyshire, England. Now it's time for Paulissima's number one dating app advice. Yes, my number one advice. Here it comes. Now, if you have to take away just one thing from this video, it will definitely have to be this. Muestra tu sentido del humor. Either mention what kind of jokes you enjoy more, what makes you laugh, what your favorite sitcoms are, or you straight up write a joke. Trust me, this is something that we Mexicans really enjoy and it works all the time. Now, let's take a look of a perfect Tinder profile for Mexico. Actually, the real life Tinder profile I told you I was going to show you does precisely that. Check it out. Picture that shows a clear smiling face, check. Picture with pet, check. So let's make a quick recap. 
This profile works because it includes the three things that you have to include in tu perfil de Tinder en español. Descriptive pictures that show his interest and respect for the place, a reference of his level of Spanish, and an allusion to his sense of humor. This is why it works and this is why I might swipe right. Should I do it? Con todo lo que has aprendido hoy, estoy segura de que incrementará la cantidad de matches en tu Tinder en español. Y además aún, estoy segura de que incrementarán tus quality matches. Matches que de verdad se pueden materializar en una cita. La Ciudad de México La Ciudad de México... Ah, la Ciudad de México. Perdón. A great writer once called La Ciudad de México, Mexico City, la región más transparente, the most transparent region. Yo estoy enamorada de esta ciudad. I am in love with this city. The oldest city in the Americas. It was once known long, 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 long time ago. It was known as Tenochtitlan. And then it was known before as Distrito Federal, Federal District. And now it goes by CDMX, CDMX, which stands for Ciudad de México. ¿Qué les puedo decir? What can I say? I adore this city. This is why I've been living here for the past year. It houses hundreds of museums and UNESCO heritage sites. And the best of it, there are amazing tacos por todos lados, everywhere. Número 2. Oaxaca. The state of Oaxaca is one of Mexico's most important touristic destination due to its cultural, artistic, and gastronomic legacies. In Oaxaca, you can also find one of the most beautiful beach towns in Mexico, Puerto Escondido. The cuisine of Oaxaca is one of the best of Mexico and therefore it's gotta be one of the best in the whole world. One of the most famous events at Oaxaca is called La Gelaguetza. La Gelaguetza is an annual indigenous cultural event that features costume dancing, parades of walking bands and there's a statewide arts and crafts um, exposition. Another super famous thing that comes from Oaxaca is the internationally known mezcal. Do you know this phrase? Para todo mal mezcal, para todo bien también. Well, mezcal is from Oaxaca just as queso Oaxaca, Oaxaca cheese, which, funny enough, they don't call queso Oaxaca, queso Oaxaca in Oaxaca. In Oaxaca, they call it just quesillo, quesillo, which means little cheese. Número 3. Quintana Roo. Quintana Roo is the best state of Mexico. <laughs> and that's because that's where my hometown, Cancun, is. And of course, I'm 100%, 100% biased. Quintana Roo is actually the last name of one of Mexico's heroes of independence, Andres Quintana Roo. With sandy beaches and the most perfect turquoise water that you have ever seen in Mayan ruins and an amazing nightlife, Cancun y la Riviera Maya, Cancun and the Mayan Riviera are actually and the most visited touristic destinations in all of Latin America. Quintana Roo is also home of algunos de los lugares más hermosos, some of the most beautiful places in all of Mexico. I'm pretty sure that your Instagram has shown you a lot of times the super famous, super trendy Tulum. But when you are in Quintana Roo, make sure you visit Puerto Morelos, Holbox, Mahahual and Bacalar. Trust me, te prometo. I promise you're not gonna regret it. Número 4. Baja California Sur. Busca en Google estos nombres ahora. Google these names right now. Los Cabos, La Paz, and Loreto. 
Los Cabos, La Paz, Loreto. I'm pretty sure you've heard of Los Cabos. This part of Mexico, it's sublime in its beauty. I'm a beach snob, 100%. And I have to tell you, the beauty of the beaches in Baja California Sur really me hizo llorar. It made me cry. It's así de hermoso. It is really that beautiful. If you're into whale watching, you have to consider visiting the National Park of Loreto. They have gray and blue whale watchings from January to March and it's just magnificent. I've only seen the videos, my mom went there and I mean, I saw dolphins, I didn't see the whales, but I saw the videos and it was amazing. Si te encantan los mariscos, if you really like seafood, you're gonna love Baja California Sur. It is super famous for its clams. So when you're in Baja California Sur, you have to, have to, there's no way around it. You have to go to Valandra Beach and La Isla del Espíritu Santo and the Island of the Holy Spirit. If you don't like it, you're weird. Número 5, Chiapas. Chiapas is a very unique state in Mexico. It's the most southern and it has the largest indigenous population of Mexico. Chiapas is also blessed with stunning natural wonders and Mayan ruins. San Cristóbal de las Casas, San Cristóbal of the Houses, that would be the literal translation, is one of the most beautiful towns in Mexico. Other places to check out in Chiapas are Chiapa de Corzo, Las Cascadas de Agua Azul, the Blue Water Waterfalls, El Cañón del Sumidero, the Sumidero Canyon, and the Lagos de Montebello, the Montebello Lakes. If you're into fashion, you are going to love Chiapas because the local designs are to die for. When you're there, por favor, no regates, please, no haggling. We already have enough with big fashion ripping off indigenous original designs. We don't want that. We want to support the local economy. Go to Chiapas and buy the indigenous textiles. They are the best. Número 1. Desayuna en casa y come en fondas. Uno de los mejores consejos que te puedo dar es que desayunes en casa. Como eres un viajero joven, moderno y aventurero, lo más seguro es que te alojes en un Airbnb o en un hostal por lo que tendrás al alcance algo de equipo de cocina. Ve a un supermercado o a un mercado local y compra tus bebidas matutinas favoritas, por ejemplo, café, té o jugos de frutas, lo que te guste. Compra cereal, pan y muchas frutas. La fruta mexicana es la mejor del mundo, mi gente. Pero si tú crees que hay otro lugar en el mundo que tenga mejor fruta que la de México, mmm, dime en los comentarios. So, you have breakfast before leaving your place. Then you go out to explore and when it's lunch time, you are going to have lunch in a fonda. Las fondas son pequeños restaurantes donde puedes comprar menús de dos o tres tiempos por un precio muy bueno. Pon atención a los siguientes chunks de español. Puedes encontrar letreros que digan menú ejecutivo o menú del día o comida corrida. Además de ser muy amigables con la billetera, las fondas ofrecen platillos muy tradicionales que tal vez de otra forma te habrías perdido. Fondas sell the kind of food that Mexican moms would cook at home. Bonus. Locals love to eat at fondas, so they are great places for you to practice your Spanish and mingle with the locals. 
The best part is that they are everywhere, even near to the most famous sites. You just have to walk a few blocks away from, you know, like the famous sites and I promise you will find a fonda. Do you want to get help from the locals? Learn this question. Disculpe, ¿una fonda por aquí? Las fondas venden comida con las tres Bs. Bueno, bonito y barato. Did you catch that? Bueno, bonito y barato. Check out this no frills grocery store that has capitalized on the phrase that Mexicans use to describe the way we like things. Bueno, bonito y barato. Before we go to the next point, just let me tell you that I have a tip I'm going to share with you that even my Mexican friends are grateful for. Número dos, viaja en transporte público. El transporte público de México tal vez no es el más bonito o el más eficiente del mundo, pero tampoco está tan mal, ¿eh? If you are in a city that has enough attractions to, you know, have attracted you to come visit, it is very likely that the sites are going to be reachable by public transportation. The difference can be abysmal. Y esto es el consejo que les doy a mis amigos mexicanos. Por ejemplo, en Cancún, ir de un hostal del centro de la ciudad a, digamos, la playa El Mirador, si te vas en taxi, serían como más de 400 pesos. Si te vas en camión, son 10 pesos. Número 3. Habla español y evita las trampas. La gente te va a tratar mucho mejor si por lo menos intentas hablar español con ellos. A simple, buenos días, buenas tardes, disculpe, can make a huge difference. Do check out our Spring Spanish Traveling Series to learn all the phrases, vocabulary, and chunks of Spanish that you will need to survive a trip to any Spanish-speaking country. Remember that chunks are word combinations or phrases that the native speakers use all the time and chunks do wonders for your speaking with confidence. Un ejemplo. ¿Cuánto cuesta? ¿Cuánto cuesta? Como en cualquier otra parte del mundo, los lugares que están cerca de los atractivos turísticos son más caros. So, if you are on a shoestring budget, avoid them. A veces los jaladores se pasan de persuasivos. ¿Los jaladores? Sí, los jaladores. Literally, it means the pullers. I mean the people who are outside the restaurant and they show you the menu and they invite you in. We call them jaladores in Mexico. How do you deal with them without being rude? No está siendo grosero. Al contrario, si cuando te abordan, les respondes con una sonrisa en la cara y la frase, ahorita no, gracias. You got it. Ahorita no, gracias. Ahorita no. Some, only some service providers do resort to abusive tactics when it comes to dealing with tourists and don't take it personal. They do it with Mexican tourists as well. So if you are under the impression that you have been mistreated, use this phrase and don't be afraid to use it. Conozco mis derechos, eh? Voy a ir a la Profeco a denunciarlos. Bam! La Profeco is the National Authority of Consumers Rights and they're not that bad actually, not bad at all. Número 4. Vea espectáculos gratuitos. It could be dances, photography exhibitions, a clown show, there's always something going on. In Mexico, we have free concerts. I once saw Gogol Bordelo for free and I know of a time where Paul McCartney threw a concert like for free in the Zócalo. Otro ejemplo es la ciudad de Mérida, donde el cuadro principal de la ciudad se cierra por completo todos los domingos. This program is called appropriately Mérida en domingo. Número 5. Compra tus recuerditos en el supermercado. Este es el mejor tip del mundo y no sé por qué no toda la gente lo hace. Hasta mis amigos mexicanos se sorprenden cuando les doy este tip. 
Major supermarket chains will carry the most popular products in the place that you are in and those are always great souvenirs to bring back home. Even if you wanted, you know, that, that uh, typical t-shirt or uh, tequila glass, you can find those in the local supermarket as well and they will be way cheaper than buying them in the shops located in the touristic areas. Numero uno, do I even have to say it? Do not try to live your life as if you are in a Narcos episode. Don't do that, my friend. Yeah, don't buy drugs. Don't talk in public about the people that you've heard about in the famous Netflix show. Don't do it. The mm, 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 stupid, super stupid. War on drugs has done a lot of damage to my country and well, you don't need to hear it from me. Tiene sentido común. You know that terrible things can happen anywhere, so please stay out of trouble. Número dos. Do not be afraid of the water. Ish. Esto es shocking hasta para mis compatriotas. But did you know that in 96% of the cities in Mexico, Tap water is actually potable. Yeah, P potable. P -p -p well, in Spanish you say potable. Yeah, that's drinking water. Potable. Potable. Now, to ensure the quality of the water once it is stored in each house, it is essential that the water tanks and cisterns are kept very clean. For greater peace of mind, one could add a disinfectant solution or boil the water before drinking it. And that's where the problem lies. Can you make sure that everyone will keep the water tanks and cisterns very clean? Do you want to go to the trouble to boil water every time you want to have a drink? Well, no. La solución? Comprar agua embotellada. No es lo más amigable con el medio ambiente, pero es lo que hacen la gran mayoría de los mexicanos. Yo no. Yo tengo un filtro en mi tap. Número 3. No tires nada en la taza en un baño público. Blame it on the old pipes. While at home or if you are in a hotel, you can flush, you know, things directly into the toilet when you're in Mexico if nature calls and you're outside and you have to use a public toilet chances are that you're going to see a bucket next to the you know to la taza the you know the, where you sit and you know do your things and there will be a sign that's gonna kindly ask you que no tires papel en la taza actually this toilet thingy, it's very common, not only in Mexico and in Latin America. I've seen it in other countries in the global south. But you know what? Whatever we lack in a 100% efficient water management system, we make up in paisajes hermosísimos, comida celestial y francamente la gente más hermosa de este planeta. Do let me know in the comments if you have seen this thing about not flushing, you know, like the paper in the, the toilet. Where did you see it? What do you think about it? Is it something that happens in your place of origin too? Let me know. And since you're there writing and doing that stuff, if so far you're liking this video, this is a good time to go ahead and spread all your digital love by liking it, sharing it, and subscribing to the channel. Número cuatro. No te quedes sin cambio. Cash is a precious commodity in Mexico. Yep. When in Mexico, you're going to need a lot of it because you're going to have to tip every person that renders a service to you, no matter how small or unasked for it was. Also, some of the best deals, you know, in food or general merchandise can be found in informal places donde no aceptan tarjetas, solamente efectivo. Cash, 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 cash. Número 5. Don't expect people to speak English. Usa tu español. Andale. While in major tourist towns like my beloved Cancun, a lot of us do speak English. As a general rule and for a better Mexican experience, please do learn some Spanish basics. 
learn how to introduce yourself, how to ask for directions, how to order food in a restaurant. And you are in luck because here at the Spring Spanish YouTube channel, we have all the videos that you will need to learn all the chunks <laughs> that you will need to survive a trip to a Spanish speaking country. Did I say chunks? Did, did I say chunks? Did I say? Yes, I did. I said chunks. Chunks. What the chunk? Chunks? Yes, chunks. <laughs> Chunks are pre-made phrases or word combinations that natives use all the time and that you can just, you know, learn like copy paste directly into your brain so you don't have to slow down, you know, yourself when you speak because you're trying to translate in your head. You know, you learn chunks so you don't have to get entangled in like grammar nightmares. To get you started, why don't you download our travel cheat sheet with the most important Spanish chunks that you will need while traveling. Get it for free in the description. Numero 6. Don't expect local food to feed your idea of Mexican food. I get it. There is amazing food in your own neighborhood in California or in New York or whatever other place you come from. I get it. But you're not there anymore. I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Yep, you're in Mexico where cumin doesn't go in every dish, where when we hear the word chimichanga we go chimique and where we don't have hard shell tacos. <laughs> no, we have tacos dorados. Tacos dorados, mijo. Tacos dorados. Also, in Mexico, each state has its own cuisine and I promise the regional food is to die for. This means that you won't find, let's say, burritos. La verdad, Yo llegué a pensar que para mí ya no había esperanza. Everywhere in Mexico, they are very specific to the north or like Jalisco, I believe. So yeah, good luck trying to find a good burrito in, I don't know, Yucatán or Tlaxcala. Actually, good luck trying to find Tlaxcala. It's like so tiny, tiny. Chiquitito, chiquitito, Tlaxcala. Recuerda el punto anterior and brush up your Spanish because that's the key to mingle with the locals who at the same time are the key to finding the best food in Mexico. So, go aprender español para ser amigos. Apúrate. Número 7. Do not disrespect the country in any way. Even if the local friends that you just made are critique y critique a México y especialmente a su gobierno, we Mexicans are a weird brand of nationalists. We can get very sensitive about strangers saying things about our food, about our legendary singers, about the way we do things. So act cool if you see, I don't know, like children drinking coffee or people going into like ferocious battles over flower arrangements in a wedding or, you know, like crazy things. Just play cool, act normal and don't make any comment unless it's to say something positive. Yeah, we like compliments. There are other things you shouldn't do too that are very, very obvious, but I'm just gonna say them anyway. Like, don't pee in public, don't give the finger to religious statues, don't damage in any way our monuments. Yeah, don't, please, just don't. No lo hagas. Número uno. No, I don't know your mate. To be fair, this one has only happened to me while I have been in the US. And it goes like this. Paulísima, ¿de dónde eres? De México. De Cancún, para ser exactos. México, amo México. La trabajadora de mi casa es mexicana. Se llama Rosa. Rosa Hernández. ¿La conoces? Let's see. There are 127 million Mexicans. Mexico has a huge territory. Granted, not as big as the US territory, but still, it's pretty huge. So, no, I'm sorry, but I don't know Rosa Hernandez. 
This has happened to me more times than I can remember, but honestly, I don't think it comes from a bad place. I really think that this kind of, you know, questions come from a good place, you know, from that very human need to connect with others, even if that connection is like super far-fetched and highly unlikely to be real. <laughs> Bueno, bueno, resulta que Hernández es uno de los apellidos más comunes en México. Siete millones lo tienen, así que mmm, es probable que sí conozca a una Rosa Hernández. Tal vez no tú, Rosa Hernández, pero a lo mejor sí alguna Rosa Hernández. <ríe> Número 2. Moctezuma is not revengeful. Seguramente has escuchado hablar de la venganza de Moctezuma. Una enfermedad que al parecer acosa a los turistas que se atreven a probar la comida mexicana. I'm not saying that it's not real, okay? I'm not denying your experience and the trauma that you went through that night when you went out all night for tacos. I'm not saying that that's not real. I'm just saying that sometimes it kind of bothers me a little bit when Americans assume like automatically that, you know, that stomach ache, it's because our food is unsanitary. You know, taking into consideration that most people's holidays involve early drinking of cervezas, tequila, or margaritas, I'm just saying that probably there are other causes for your upset stomach. Perhaps it's not that our food is unsanitary, perhaps you didn't wash your hands. Just to be safe, mi gente, do follow this advice. This is the advice that I grew up with. Y tengo que decir que para mí todo lo que voy a decir suena a sentido común. But then I realized that not everybody grew up like me, you know, like in Cancun, in a time when there were actual cholera outbreaks. Yeah, so, consejo número uno. No coman frutas o verduras frescas en la calle. Y esto puede ser muy difícil porque todo el mundo sabe que la fruta y la verdura de México es la mejor del mundo. So instead, buy it and peel it yourself and eat it at home. Consejo número dos. Pide tus bebidas sin hielo. No confíes en el hielo. Unless you're in a proper establishment, hold it on the ice. Consejo número tres. Lávate bien las manos. It shouldn't take a pandemic to remind us all that soap is our best ally against all kinds of pathogens, right? Número 3. Repeat after me. Estadounidense. Or estadounidense. Estadounidense, estadounidense. Both work. You know that even I have gotten in trouble here on YouTube for using the word American to describe Americans? The thing that in Spanish, the word for the nationality that we're talking about is not Americano, but Estadounidense or Estadounidense. And the reason why it's because for me and millions and millions and millions of other Latin American people, well, this is America. América es la palabra que utilizamos para referirnos a todo el continente. This is Estados Unidos. So if you are speaking Spanish, please don't say soy americano or soy americana. Instead, say soy estadounidense or soy estadounidense with an U. Yeah. And you know, just one little thing before I continue. I have noticed that when prompted, if you ask an American about their place of origin, they tend to reply with the city of, you know, the city where they're from. You ask anyone in the whole world where they're from and you get Australia, Kenya, France. But you ask an American and it goes like this. ¿De dónde eres? De Colorado. Or like, de Sacramento. Or like, de San Antonio. Like, Am I supposed to know all of these places? Please don't get mad at me for pointing these things out. You know, it's all in good spirits. Actually, do the opposite of getting mad and like this video and share it everywhere. Número 4. People are not props. Please, when in Mexico, don't take pictures using people as props to then share them on your social media. That's so cringeworthy that I can't even. Seriously. Anyway. No matter how colorful their outfit is, no matter how cute the little chubby little kid is, it doesn't matter. People are not props. Ask yourself, 
will that person take a picture with you and then go and share it in their social media saying stuff like, look at this cute American I met today. They wouldn't do that, right? Then why would you? I get it, I get it. You're in another country, you're enjoying how beautiful and amazing Mexico is and you want to make friends with the locals. All of that is fantastic. And you can take pictures with people, but do ask them. Disculpe, ¿me puedo tomar una foto con usted? Or, disculpe, ¿le puedo tomar una foto? But be mindful of your intentions. Why do you want this photo? Just as a memento of your amazing time in Mexico, is it for your eyes only? Then go ahead, do it. Fantastic. Do you want to share it, you know, just to tell the world how exotic you find Mexicans or how unique that little child is or, you know, to show the world how generous you are by interacting with the less privileged? Yeah, that's uncool. Don't do it. Don't do it. Número cinco. Yes, I look Mexican. Pero pareces asiática. ¿Eres mexicana de verdad? I have heard these phrases so many times in my life. And to be honest, I don't blame you. I blame the media. Because really, if you are to believe America's media, all Mexicans either work in construction or are in a gang or work as house servants. On the other hand, if you were to believe Mexican media, then all Mexicans are blonde and have blue eyes and are very rich. So no, it's not like that, all right? Mexicans come in all colors and we are as diverse as it gets. And I know that the vast majority of people knows this. So please, please don't ask people why they don't fit into the idea that you have in your head about how a Mexican is supposed to look like. Argentina is a big country with a lot of history and a lot of different cultural influences from Europe and other parts of Latin America. They're very passionate about their traditions and country. So if you want to blend in smoothly when you travel to Argentina, try and keep up with these cultural rules. They also have their own dialect and accent and some words only used in Argentina which I'll be using. So, if any Argentinian friends are watching this video, te lo pido por favor, tirame la posta con mi acento argentino. Please tell me the truth about my Argentinian accent. First one, el asado. If there is anything that Argentina is known for worldwide, is their meat. So much that one of their most important traditions throughout the whole country is el asado. I guess you could say that means the barbecue, but it's actually much more than that. It's a great opportunity for friends and family to gather and celebrate any occasion. If you ever have the fortune to get invited to an asado, then get another notch on your belt because you're in for a real carnivore feast, donde el cerdo, la carne, el cordero, el vino y el fernet were pork, beef, lamb, wine and fernet get together in a meat devouring, yummy tasting, friend making, joy engulfing, great experience. Yeah, I'm a big fan. Se me nota. Can you notice it? Even though most of the time you spend in an asado, you'll be gorging down on grilled food or chugging some wine, fernet or cerveza, beer, you still should know some vocabulary to ask for more chimichurri or llamar una ambulancia, call an ambulance after the food coma you'll get. So let's learn some chunks you can use in an asado. Che, ¿armamos una picada para la espera? So, shall we set up a picada in the meantime? ¿Me pasas el fernet? Can you pass the fernet to me? ¿Y quién quiere pan? Who wants some bread? ¿Quedó algún choricito? Are there any sausages left? Un aplauso para el asador. An ovation to the asado. You know what? Asado is such an extensive topic that we could even have our own video about it. What do you think? Would you like to know more about el asado argentino? The Argentinian barbecue? Animate y decime en los comentarios, che. 
go ahead and let us know in the comments, mate. Second one, el mate. As I said before, Argentina is a cultural melting pot of European and Latin American roots. The Argentina mate originated in northern Argentina with the Guarani indigenous culture. Mate can be drunk all throughout the day, but it's most popular during la merienda de la tarde, the afternoon snack time. Mate is a tea made with the yerba mate leaves poured into a gourd and drunk through una bombilla, which is a metal straw that prevents the leaves to be sucked in. There are some traditions never to be broken about la ceba del mate, the pouring of the mate tea, so make sure you learn them. El mate se toma en grupo, made it strong in groups. This is not a strict rule, as you can drink your mate on your own. Solo el líder puede cebar el mate. Only the leader, which normally is the mate court owner, can pour the tea and pass it to the crew. La bombilla no se mueve. The bombilla straw never moves. Cuando ya no quieras más, entrega el mate y decí gracias. When you're done, give the mate to the leader and say thank you. You can give the mate as many rounds as there is hot water and good conversation. But once you've had enough, give it back to the leader and say thank you. That will let them know you're done and you don't want any more tea. El mate se puede disfrutar con facturas. The mate tea can be enjoyed with facturas, which are these sweet little pastries combined with dulce de leche, milk caramel, or crema pastelera, sweet pastry cream. Cae como piña, fits like a glove, literally falls like a pineapple. Nota importante para mis amigos alemanes. Important note for my German friends. Club Mate Soda? Not a thing. Just listen to what my Argentinian friends think about it. Escuchame una cosa, ¿cómo se les va a ocurrir poner el mate en una botella? ¿A quién se le ocurre meter el mate en una botella? En serio, en serio lo estoy preguntando. ¿Cómo se te va a ocurrir que se te mete el mate en una botella? ¿Entendés? El mate se se, 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 va, se comparte, se gira. Es un momento, un momento de encuentro con el otro, con tu vecino. Con... So what do you say? Thinking about giving mate a chance the next time you stumble into an argentino? Let me know if you tried it before in the comments. Third one, el fútbol, soccer. Oh boy, where should I start here? Screams, curse words, joy, chants, anthems, euphoria, cheering, heart attacks, street celebration, historical rivalries, you name it. El fútbol argentino lo tiene todo. Argentine soccer has it all. It's no surprise two of the best soccer players in the history of football come from Argentina, Messi and Maradona. Football is a very important part of Argentine culture and everyone has a favorite team. Let's review some chunks to talk about soccer and to avoid getting una tarjeta roja, a red card in your conversations with Argentinos. El super clásico se juega entre el Boca Juniors y el River Plate. The super derby match is played between Boca Juniors and River Plate. This important event is contested between Argentina's two most popular and successful teams, Buenos Aires Rivals, River Plate, and Boca Juniors. Argentina tiene dos Copas del Mundo. Argentina has two World Cups. The Argentina national team is one of the eight to have won the FIFA World Cup, having done so twice. Argentina has also won the top continental tournament, the Copa America, 14 times, so they take a lot of pride in their football. Mi equipo la rompe mal, boludo. Literally, my team breaks it bad. But the actual meaning of this chunk will be something like my team is the best of them all, mate. Argentinians are very passionate about their teams. You'll hear them scream with joy and praise their favorite players when they win, but also curse them like pirates when they screw up. No! No! 